So welcome, welcome to this Rewards Intermediate Training, part one. Uh, and we are so uh, grateful for your attendance uh, to learn about this program and how to teach it. Uh, and some of you have already uh, taught it and just wanted uh, a little polishing of what you already know. Excellent. Uh, so before we start, uh, there are some things that we're going to do to keep us involved uh, throughout this time. And we have with us today teachers uh, who are in general ed, teachers who are in special ed, teachers who are in intervention, uh, and we have administrators and we celebrate all of you. Uh, but one thing we know, uh, whether I teach in any of those environments, is that the number of responses that we elicit from students is going to be directly related to the amount of learning that occurs. And so even when we do a webinar, the good instruction has to be interactive. I say something, you say something, I do something, you do something uh, so that we are all involved. Uh, one of my favorite mottos for active participation is everyone does everything. Everyone says it, everybody writes it, everybody does it. And one of the things, the corollary that goes with that is we get rid of uh, volunteers, having, uh, asking a question, having kids volunteer because uh, who call, who raises their hand? High performing student, uh, students that are proficient in English, uh, students who are assertive. It's what I call teaching the best and leaving the rest. So uh, when we teach rewards, uh, we do the same kind of active participation we're gonna do in this webinar. Uh, and uh, many of the responses in rewards are very short. Uh, and so instead of calling on one student to say the answer, everybody will say the sound, everybody will say the prefix, everybody will say the word. Uh, and uh, so we are going to do that, but you're going to be muted. Now, if you want to optimize your learning today, we know from research uh, in cognitive science that if you have overt responses, not just thinking responses, but overt responses, that you are going to learn more. So wherever you are, you might want to talk out loud uh, and say the answers uh, out loud. And sometimes we will read things together. Uh, and we know that the more reading that you do in a reading class, the more likely that you are to gain skills. And so often we support that, scaffold that with choral reading. And the main thing we have to remember is in choral reading, being certain that we don't read uh, too fast, which is always my error as a teacher. But if I'm reading it with them, I'm going to read it at a moderate rate of speech. And sometimes uh, we repeated that one. We'll do short responses and we'll do close reading. Now, close reading is where I read and I stop and you say the next word. That's a very good way if you have something short to uh, read that you want to read quickly and you want the students to be attentive, uh, it works very well. And you need paper and uh, writing tools. So today you need to have paper right by you, like I have one here, uh, where I'm going to uh, do some responses. Uh, and then uh, sometimes we will put the written responses in the chat box. And we do have a chat box, and, uh, but the only person you get to chat with is Sarah. Uh, and what you need to do is send Sarah questions to the chat box. Uh, and then I will stop occasionally and Sarah will ask the questions. So uh, any inquiry that you have, place that in the chat box. But most of the day, we are going to uh, practice teaching the activities. Uh, and we will do basically what we call duet uh, teaching, where we teach it together. Uh, so you're familiar with all of the uh, routines within the program. 
So that's what we're doing, but it is a reminder from the very first day of school, no matter where we're teaching, uh, we want to request responses from students so that everybody says it, everybody writes it, everybody does it. And I tell you that is the biggest transformative movement we can make in school sites uh, is to increase opportunities to respond. Well, uh, so there is the rewards program. Uh, and I'm sitting right here with it. And I do want to explain this before we go any further because we have some people who are in middle schools. So there actually is two versions of this program. And the first one we did research on uh, was with uh, sixth through ninth graders uh, at middle schools. Uh, and uh, the outcome was extraordinarily high. Uh, and so many teachers said, but we could do these skills before they go to middle school, such as in fourth and fifth and sixth grade at an elementary school. And uh, we said, yes, you could, but they might need more lessons. Uh, and so we increased the number of lessons and they might need uh, paragraphs and passages that are more appropriate to fourth and fifth graders. So that's why we have two versions. So most of your elementary, and you'll be teaching this one, and the same content uh, is taught in uh, rewards secondary uh, with just some modifications based on older students. All right, so that is the one that we are going to look at is right here. Now, when you got uh, access to the materials for this training, you also uh, received uh, the materials called Providing Reading Interventions for Students in Grades 4 through ninth Grade. And this just came out in March 2022. And it was uh, done by the Institute of Educational Sciences, which is part of our federal government. And what this institute does is this. Uh, every year they have one or two questions that are uh, ones of important to elementary or secondary teachers and educators. Uh, and they then get a team of people uh, who are familiar with that area. And then they get all of the studies that are to that point, but they have very high requirements for the study being kept uh, in the pool of studies they're going to use then they use those studies uh, to come up with recommendations. And there have been many, many, many IES practice guides uh, that uh, are available online that are excellent. Uh, questions like, how should we teach fractions to fourth and fifth graders? Because that's one of their major problems in math. Uh, how should we do writing in the primary grades? What does research tell us to do in terms of adolescent literacy? It's a wealth of knowledge uh, that I think had too few people reading them. They're really well done. And the reason we have this one is because every single one of the recommendations uh, were totally mirrored by rewards. In fact, many of the studies that they used used rewards uh, in terms of their intervention. Uh, and so uh, if you want a rationale for what we're doing today, the federal government wrote one for us. Uh, and what's fascinating, here is my copy. Okay, it's like a big document. But uh, if we look at it, this segment is the summary of the research studies that they looked at uh, for evidence uh, of why we would want to do this in a program. Uh, and so it's really extraordinarily fascinating. Uh, and you might want to read your copy of it. So we have two documents, uh, but the IS practice guide is definitely in support of rewards. So here's what we're gonna do in part one. Uh, we do have a second part uh, that will be coming up later. And the purpose of that uh, doing it this way is uh, there's so much content we wanted to teach for the first lessons in the program. 
and then we're going to do a shorter session on the remaining uh, lessons. So we're going to answer these questions. What is rewards? Uh, what are the goals of rewards? Uh, who is it designed for? How do we determine if they would be a good match to the program? And uh, what materials are necessary for the program? And then most importantly, how is rewards taught? Because we're actually gonna practice each activity in rewards so that you will say, yes, uh, I can do this and I can also share it with other people. And how we might monitor their progress is very important. And then how do I get started? Because the school year is coming upon us. So that is sort of our pathway through today. And we're gonna first get enough background knowledge on exactly uh, what the program is about uh, and uh, what kind of research was done on it because the more you know the why, the better off you are when you teach the how. So we're gonna spend some time on uh, this. Now, uh, this program is authored by three people, uh, and I'm the senior author of the program. Uh, and uh, the other two authors is Mary Gleason uh, and uh, Dr. Vicki Vishon. Uh, and so it, uh, I researched the program while I was at University of Oregon. And uh, Dr. Mary Gleason was the best student I've ever had. And she went on to be a professor at University of Oregon. And she had a student named Dr. Vicki Vishon, uh, who was her best student. Uh, and all three of us worked on this project. Uh, so just a week ago, uh, Vicki Vishon and Dr. Mary Gleason were given uh, a honor at a conference at, in Eugene uh, for their uh, contributions to education. So we celebrate that. Um, so what is rewards? Well. Uh, first of all, when it was first written and researched, we called it the multisyllabic word reading program. Uh, and uh, we even, it was so long ago that we had copies of it across the nation that were at Kinko's and you could go in and get it copied for free. Uh, and I said to Mary, when we were doing the revisions, uh, I said, you know, multisyllabic word reading program, you know, that doesn't sound like a very good name. Uh, could you think of a better one? And she said, okay. And the next day she came in and she said, how do you like rewards? And I said, well, given the amount of gains the students had, it was certainly rewards. But she said, uh, actually it's a mnemonic device. Uh, and so it is uh, reading excellence, uh, word attack and rate development strategies. So it tells you exactly what is the content. Content is meant to teach the students how to read multisyllabic words uh, and also how to improve uh, their rate of reading, their fluency of reading, their automaticity in reading, uh, which is necessary for comprehension. So thus we have the term rewards, though I don't think very few people understand that it is reading excellence, word attack, and rate development strategies. Uh, and there's the three authors. Uh, so first, it is a research validated specialized reading program. Now, the fact that it is research validated is different than if it was research based. It started by being research-based in that we looked at the research. Uh, when I was first researching this, looked at the research and from it designed the program. And then we did research on it to see if it actually worked. Uh, and particularly when we have uh, students that are struggling students, we wanna be certain that they get basically the very best instruction that could fill in some of this gap and lift them up closer to their grade level readers. And so uh, having it research validated by the authors, all three of us have done studies uh, using rewards, but now it has had many, many studies that are external. Uh, studies uh, by researchers at different universities uh, have uh, used rewards as their intervention. 
So it's research validated. It works if it is taught with fidelity and the parts of the program are taught to mastery uh, and uh, the students make significant, significant gains. Um, and it is a specialized reading program. So it's not meant to be for an entire year. It is for a shorter period of time, very, very intentional time. And uh, intermediate is designed specifically for fourth, fifth and sixth graders uh, at the elementary school. It's been used with uh, students uh, who are struggling readers also uh, in fifth or sixth and seventh grade as they go into middle school. Okay, so uh, it is a short term intervention uh, and meaning it's not for the whole year. Uh, there's 25 lessons in the program and uh, the first set of lessons that we're looking at one through 15 is part one of this training and each of the lessons take 50 to 60 minutes. So what we found in elementary school is many people had intervention for like 30 minutes. So then each lesson would take two days uh, if that was the case. Uh, and basically uh, the teacher teaches the activities in a lesson. Uh, and let's say that uh, they have 30 minutes and they get to a certain point and then they pick it up uh, there the next day. And then the students are taught strategies that use all the pre-skills in the initial lessons. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about in our second training. Um, so, uh, and those take uh, about the same amount of time uh, for those specific lessons. Okay, so, and except for the last few lessons where the students are reading uh, passages that are quite involved might take up to 90 minutes. And we, we normally recommend that this be taught five days a week, which is usually the case if it's done in a general ed class or if it's done in intervention. Now, occasionally I have had people say, well, we have something else that we need to do. We're gonna work on writing on Friday. Can we do it four days a week? And we had very good results when it was five days a week and four days a week. What doesn't work is where some people say, well, we're gonna have an after school program on Tuesdays because then there's too much space between it and the students uh, have too much loss in terms of forgetting information. And so we can't build on it. So we don't recommend one day a week uh, if you really wanna make a difference with the students. Okay, that's just to give you a picture. Uh, we actually know like for in reading comprehension that giving students sort of a mental map of what they're going to do significantly increases their ability to uh, be able to utilize what they're reading. So I just wanted to give you a mental map. You're thinking of a program and that's oh, 25 minutes. Maybe it takes two days to teach it uh, and it needs to be taught five days a week. So you have a little mental map, but get that term in your repertoire because it's extraordinarily useful to remind us to give kids a mental map before we read something. All right, well, what are the goals of the program? So that what were the specific goals that was designed for and measured, and we made a significant difference in terms of these goals. Uh, and here's a quick summary, and then a mental map, uh, and then we will look at each one of them. So first and foremost, our desire was to teach students uh, to read uh, multisyllabic words. <clears throat> so if we, we have many fourth and fifth grade teachers, and, and I know that you've noticed this, that the number of multisyllabic words significantly increases in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, and that many struggling readers do not have a strategy, uh, a procedure for figuring out those words and need to have uh, that kind of procedure and routine. So our first goal is that they would be able to read long words. 
uh, and that they would read them uh, in text more accurately and with appropriate rate, which we refer to as fluency. Now, all of you have studied fluency and basically uh, fluency is automaticity. And we're gonna see that uh, to be a good reader, you have to have something that is automatic so that you can put all of your cognitive attention on what you are reading, not on figuring out the words and sounding them out. So it is important that the students are accurate and that they have automaticity or rate. And our goal was also to expand their vocabulary. And many of these students, because of their lower reading skills, have not read. Uh, and so they haven't picked up the vocabulary from one of the biggest sources, which is from their reading. Uh, but uh, we need to be certain that uh, we are extending in any program their general academic and domain specific vocabulary. And that they would have increased comprehension. Okay, now let's just remember this. I often uh, do speeches that have this as the motto. Comprehension is an outcome. Comprehension is not a single strategy. Comprehension is an outcome that is not a strategy. What does it mean It's an outcome? Well, if I have material in front of me that I'm reading, uh, I have to be able to read the words. Uh, and so I have to be able to read it fluently. I have to understand the meaning of the words and have background knowledge. And then I need to focus my attention on the content. But if I can't read the words, or if I don't know the meaning of the words, or if I don't have any background knowledge, uh, then I am going to have fractured comprehension. So everything we're doing is meant to lead to increased comprehension. And then, uh, ah, we have one more goal, and that is that the students are able to spell uh, more multisyllabic grade level words. Uh, and why do we want spelling? Well, because if you have to spell words, it uses the same knowledge as if you're going to decode multisyllabic words. And so these are reciprocal. If I teach you the spelling of the words, it strengthens your reading of the words. If I teach you strategies for figuring out the words, it increases the probability of spelling. Uh, so those are the goals, but let's look at them just to have a little more background knowledge as uh, educators. And I will be certain to turn off my phone. Just I heard a little ding. So uh, everybody read this one with me and go. Decode unknown multisyllabic words containing two to eight word parts. So that is uh, the goal that we had was to teach them a strategy, uh, uh, giving them the ability to figure out unknown multisyllabic words. Uh, and uh, when we look in the IS practice guide, their first recommendation, which has a strong body of research to support it, and read it with me, build students decoding skills so they can read complex multisyllabic words. You realize how joyful we have felt when the IS practice guide had as their first recommendation and rewards has their first goal exactly the same. Uh, but let's think a little bit why, because we have actually studies over the last 50 years that would give us a reason why rewards focused on reading complex multisyllabic words. And uh, first, if you can't read the words, there is no comprehension hope. It's as simple as that. 
So if I have students in my class with low comprehension, one of the major problems is they might not be able to read the words. Uh, and so word recognition is necessary, but it's not sufficient. You have to be able to read the words, but you also have to know the meaning of the words and have background knowledge to allow comprehension. So uh, let me take you to uh, Plain Talk, which is a reading, a great reading conference. It's held uh, in Louisiana, uh, in New Orleans every year. And so one day I was speaking there and then I was walking uh, to a wonderful restaurant uh, and the woman in front of me had a sweatshirt on and it said this, there is no comprehension strategy powerful enough to compensate for the fact that you can't read the words. And I said, well, that's so interesting because I didn't know that this quote that I made in 2006 ended up on a sweatshirt. So I tapped the person on uh, back and she turned around and I said, well, you know, that quote that you have is one that I wrote uh, when I was training in reading first across the nation. Uh, and she said, what? And I said, yeah. And she said, would you sign it? <laughs> so right there, uh, we found a pin and I signed it. But there is great truth in this. There is no comprehension strategy powerful enough to compensate for the fact that you can't read the words. You have to read the words to have access. It's not enough to be able to read the words, but you've got to be able to read the words. Uh, and we do know that struggling students uh, in fourth, fifth, sixth grade have difficulty with multisyllabic words and they need a strategy. Now, here's some interesting studies. Okay, maybe I'm the only one who's really fascinated by this, but I am. So uh, this is one that's very important for us to note, and it has been verified in many studies over time. And I want you to read it with me and go. Poorly developed word recognition skills are the most pervasive and debilitating source of reading challenges. Uh, so that when we have students that are doing poorly in reading, uh, one of the major things that's leading to that is their lack of decoding skills. Uh, and when uh, we looked at this, and this study was done a while ago, but it was a very good study in which they found that many students that were poor decoders that they could decode single syllable words, but could not and had difficulty with reading multisyllabic words. So they could sound out uh, a word like um, sad, sad, sad. But when it came to a word like unconventionality, they had no approach. So just because they can read single syllable words, it does not uh, mean that they're going to generalize that and be able to read multisyllabic words. Um, we even have some studies to show what kind of challenges they have with multisyllabic words. Okay, and so this was a very interesting study that looked at how they attack long words. And what they found was that many of the poor readers tried to use the letter by letter decoding strategy that they learn for single syllable words. Uh, and so uh, you have a very short word uh, and you look at the letters and you say the sounds and you blend it together. Uh, but when it comes to a long word, that strategy uh, is not fruitful. So for example, uh, let's say that I try to figure out this word sound by sound. K -a -n -t -r -k -a -k -w -eyes. versus count er clockwise. So with multisyllabic words, we have to break it down into decodable chunks. Count er clockwise in order to attack it. 
So the students have to be taught a strategy uh, that would help them uh, know how to put this into decodable chunks. So that's one study. They try to do it line by line. But another large study that was done by Scheffelbein uh, found that poor readers, when they are reading a long word, had consistent kind of errors that they would mispronounce affixes uh, and vowels and omit syllables. And particularly in our work, we found that oftentimes when the students had a word like unconventionality, uh, they said things like unvention. They did not include all of the syllables uh, or uh, they also mispronounced um, affixes. So instead of unconventionality, they would say unconventionality. So they mispronounced. This is in most commonly is not con but con. And this is definitely not tie on, it is shun. Uh, and so uh, the students again would profit from instruction that would help them break it down into parts uh, and then accurately pronounce particularly prefixes and suffixes. Pretty fascinating, isn't it? Well, I'm fascinated by it. Uh, and here is the challenge that goes along with the fact that the students have difficulty reading multisyllabic words. That is that starting in, the research started in fifth grade, but they found that uh, the average student has to learn about 10,000 words a year that they've never seen in print starting in fifth grade, sixth grade, and on up. 10,000 words. Now we can't teach 10,000 words to students word by word, but we could teach them a strategy that would give them access uh, to 10,000 words. Uh, and that's what rewards is about. And most of the words are longer words. And this one's very important. The IS, uh, IES practice guide pointed out that when you look in a fourth grade text or a fifth grade text, uh, the multisyllabic words often carry the meaning uh, of the text. Uh, and so if I can't read the words and have access to them, then I cannot connect to the meaning of those words. Now, let me just take a moment and we're gonna prove this point. Um, so you are going to read this out loud with me, uh, but uh, when we come to a word that is underlined, which is all the multisyllabic words, uh, we are going to say blank uh, and then go to the next word. When blank from blank arrived in blank. Got it? Okay. So we're just going to see what would happen if you were unable to decode these multisyllabic words. Okay, are you ready? All right. Reading it with me. When blank from blank arrived in blank in 1500, as many as five blank blank, blank, lived there. During the 1500s, the blank, blank, large sugar cane, blank, in blank, blank. At first they blank, 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 to work on the blank. Soon, however, many blank, blank, died of blank. The blank, blank, then turned to blank, for blank. A blank, blank, brought over more blank, blank, than any other north or south blank blank. Now that's a lot of blankety blank, but can you see uh, how this passage uh, from a textbook, uh, much like they would see it, is going to have no meaning if they cannot uh, decode uh, these multisyllabic words. Well, uh, I'm hoping you just have an idea of why we need to teach this. Now, what we need here, though, is a flexible strategy. Now, I look back on my uh, schooling when I was a girl, and we were taught uh, the perfect syllabication rules. And maybe you remember some of these. Let me just bring you uh, back into that learning. 
So uh, when you have two consonants in the middle of the word, you divide between those consonants. Now, when you have an open syllable, uh, that is a consonant vowel, uh, then you want to divide after the vowel. But if instead you have uh, a closed syllable, that's a consonant vowel consonant, you divide after the consonant. Now, if you have a prefix, you want to divide after the prefix, uh, but if you have a suffix, you want to divide before the suffix. Now, in a word, uh, when you have a single vowel letter, you divide after the consonant, but if you uh, have a consonant blend, then you want to divide before that blend. Okay, so we had a list of rules. I just gave you some of them. And you were to divide it up into perfect syllables. However, uh, looking right down here, there's no relationship exists between knowledge of syllabication rules and successful reading. What did, what did that study look at? Well, this study looked at this. Uh, so they tested children on their knowledge of putting it into perfect dictionary syllables. Uh, and uh, they then looked at their ability to read long words. And they simply found no predictive relationship. Uh, it should be that if you are really good at dividing it into syllables, that you'd have more success. But that was not the case. Uh, there was no correlation between the two. They had students that could do excellent slashing into syllables, but poor reading, or students that could read very well uh, with no syllabication knowledge. So we determined from the very get-go that the students need a much more flexible strategy, and that's what we teach. Uh, one uh, that they could use uh, to decode multisyllabic words. And that, you'll notice, is exactly uh, what was recommended um, by the IS practice guide, that they would be taught a routine that they could use to decode multisyllabic words, but it needed to be flexible, flexible. And you'll see what we mean by that. Well, there's the strategy that we teach. And so uh, follow my cursor, circle the prefixes, circle the suffixes, underline the vowels, say the parts of the word, say the whole word, and make it a real word. So let's just look at an example. So be ready to say the answers. Okay, so circle the prefix, what prefix? Pre, circle the suffix, what suffix? Shun. Say the vowel, what sound? E, eh. and say the parts, prevention. So what we are doing here is putting it into decodable chunks uh, based on the fact that uh, we could peel off the prefix, peel off the suffix, and look for the vowels and rest of the word that would put it into decodable chunks. Then we say the parts of the word, and then we say the whole word to make it a real word. Now, uh, let's just look at another example. Um, so first step, circle the prefixes. And what prefix, everyone? Un, what prefix? Pro. Uh, then, uh, uncircle the suffixes and what suffix? Tiv. And then say this sound. Uh. So there's one, two, three, four decodable chunks in this word. And what part? Un, what part? Pro, what part? Duck, what part? Tiv. And what's the word? Unproductive. Don't you want all of your fourth graders to be able to read a word like unproductive? But we want them to be productive. Uh, and um, now, some word, this word had more than one prefix. This word had three suffixes. So circle the prefixes. There is no prefix. Circle the suffixes, and you start at the end. What suffix? Ul. <coughs> what suffix? Full. What suffix? Er. 
and then underline the vowel sound ah. One, two, three, four parts. And you read it this way, masterfully. Masterfully. That's how we want them to read. Now, this strategy is based on some realities in English. First reality in English is that 80% of multisyllabic words have a prefix or a suffix. That is very high odds. So multisyllabic words, almost all of them have either a prefix or suffix or multiple prefix and suffixes. So the first thing we do is peel off the prefixes, peel off the suffixes. The other reality is that every word part in a multisyllabic word contains letters that represent a vowel. Every word part has a vowel sound. And so then we can utilize that to find the remaining parts of the word. So that is exactly why uh, we uh, utilize this strategy in the overt strategy with overt behavior. Circle the prefix, circle the suffix, underline the vowels, say the parts of the word, then say the whole word and make it a real word. Now, this is really critical because there's no strategy that will get you the absolute perfect pronunciation of a multisyllabic word. So one day I was in the class and a student was reading this sentence. Uh, we went on vacation and we stayed in a hot tail. Now the students had used the right, the letters, there was two vowel letters, put it into two parts, hot tail. Unless it was a really good vacation, uh, it should have been a hotel. Uh, and so, uh, they needed to adjust it to their oral oral language. They always have to make it a real word. And you say, but some of my students uh, are not yet facile in English and they don't have that word in their oral oral language. What should we do? Well, then we tell them the word. The word is hotel. What word? Hotel. All right. So now we don't want the kids for whole life having to have a pen, circling the prefix, circling the suffix, underlining the vowels, say the parts, say it fast, make it a real word. Uh, so at the end of the program, we begin to fade it out where they look at the word, look for the prefixes, look for the suffix, look for the vowels, say the parts, say the whole word and make it a real word. So we go from an over one with a definitive actions. Remember, overt responses are extraordinarily useful as we're learning things, but then we could go to a covert uh, strategy that is used in the head. All right. Um, so now, older students benefit from systematic instruction of multisyllabic words. Not just our research group, but uh, at uh, Shufflebein found that if we teach the students uh, affixes and vowels, they made significant gains in multisyllabic words. Uh, a project at University of Kansas uh, found that when they taught a decoding strategy for long words, uh, that not only did the students have fewer errors, but had significant increases in comprehension. And a recent study that was done by Lene Airy and students found that uh, it went through all of the grade levels in terms of improving the student's ability to read long words. So that is uh, some of the reasons that we would wanna teach the students a strategy. They're, they have difficulty with multisyllabic words, and when we have taught it, it's made a significant difference in terms of uh, their decoding and as a result, their comprehension. So that is the main goal of the program uh, is to lift them up in terms of the words that they could read. But it's not enough to be accurate. Uh, and so read the second goal of the program with me and go read narrative and informational texts accurately with appropriate rate, thus fluency. Uh, and 
in the IS practice guide. Their second recommendation matches rewards beautifully. And read it with me, provide purposeful fluency building activities to help students read effortlessly. And that is exactly what we do uh, is that we work on fluency. You know, let's just think a moment why this is so important uh, that the students read with ease and expression and appropriate pacing or rate. Um, first of all, it is re related to comprehension. Now, let's just take a little back look at this, that all of us know that uh, we have working memory and permanent memory. And working memory is where we do all of our thinking, all of our problem solving. And so that if I'm reading and I have to figure out a word, then I have to use my cognitive energy in my working memory. But if I, with automaticity, can quickly identify that word and read it, uh, thus having fluency, then all of my cognitive energy can go to comprehension, not to figuring out the words. Uh, and so that is exactly what the IS practice guide pointed out. So you're going to, when I stop, say the next word. When students read fluently, they can turn their attention from sounding out the individual words to making sense of what they are reading. That is exactly what our goal was. That if you can read with automaticity, you can put all of your attention on sounding out the words. Now, this is a big idea that goes way beyond fluency in reading. For example, we know that if students have automaticity in math facts, uh, that they can turn their attention uh, to solving more complex problems so that then they don't have to stop and figure it out in working memory. They already have it stored in permanent memory, comes up uh, and thus they're able to do it. We know this in terms of writing, that if I have automaticity in spelling and automaticity in punctuation, uh, that when I am writing, I don't have to stop and say, well, how do you figure, how do you spell that word or what punctuation mark is necessary? Or even their handwriting needs to be automatic so that they don't have to stop and think, well, how do I make the letter P? so that all of my thought can be on the content that I want to convey in print. So automaticity, true mastery, uh, it makes a difference in so many content areas. Well, in reading is what we're working on. And there are a number of problems when you aren't fluent. And one of them is lower comprehension, but there's other ones. And read this quote and summation by uh, Louisa Motes. When reading is slow and laborious, struggling readers select not to read. Big problem. And so we know that when you are an accurate fluent reader, you read more. And there are many, many benefits that come from reading more, whether it's in class material uh, or it is for recreation. Uh, there's many things you gain from reading. So I want you uh, on your scratch pad, I've got mine available here. We're going to take a moment and just uh, brainstorm benefits of reading more. Uh, and so if I'm a fluent reader, I'm going to read more. Um, and one benefit is that I'm going to put down here the major one from the research uh, is that I'm going to learn more vocabulary. In fact, when we look at you as an adult, 
uh, and we look at your vocabulary, there's a direct relationship between the amount you read and the vocabulary that you're able to use both uh, receptively and expressively uh, in, ter uh, in terms of comprehension, in terms of listening comprehension, as well as uh, in writing. So there's really through our whole life, a relationship of vocabulary to our performance. So here's your job on your page, think about it and write down. You don't have to write sentences, just notes of what would be benefits of reading more. Okay, so you wrote down some benefits uh, and now you're gonna pick your two best ideas and put it in the chat box. And Sarah is going to summarize it for us. Uh, so you'll have a few seconds to put it in before we talk about it and go. Let me know when you're ready to, for me to start reading them, Anita. Okay. Now, here's what we're going to do while she reads them. she pause a little after each one. But oftentimes, uh, when I give feedback and kids have a list, I will have them uh, listen very carefully. And if someone gives a really good idea, they're going to look down their list. And if they have the same idea on their list, they're going to cross it out. If it is a really good idea, but they don't have it, they're going to add it to their list. So we're going to do that just as uh, something that you can do with your fourth and fifth graders, which significantly increases their attention uh, when we're giving feedback. So, for example, Sarah, what is one that you saw a number of times, probably? Um, let's see. Um, increased or improved comprehension. Excellent. So... Uh, if you have that one, cross it out and we have increased or expanded vocabulary. Excellent. Okay, so they've already hit the two big ones uh, that uh, if you read more, you're going to gain vocabulary and it will improve your comprehension. Yes. Um, Wanting to read or reading becomes more joyful. So things Excellent. along that line, the desire mm -hmm. to read. So they're going to be uh, more joyful, more confident. Uh, they're going to be more motivated to read uh, if they uh, have uh, fluency. Excellent. Yes, fluency is also one that's in there quite a bit. So the more you read, the more automatic you're going to get. So it's going to build your fluency. Okay, one more idea. Um, let me see here. I see knowledge quite a bit increases your knowledge. Absolutely. And that's a big one. Uh, so you're going to get more background knowledge. Excellent job. So uh, Stanovich uh, sort of summarized it this way. Uh, the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. So I'm an automatic, uh, I have good fluency, so I read more. 
and I'm going to get more vocabulary, more competency and comprehension. I'm going to get more background knowledge. I'm going to get more knowledge. I'm going to get more information. Uh, and all of those things occur. I'm going to get my assignments done. Uh, and so there are many benefits of being able to uh, read fluently and because you're going to read more and get all those benefits. Beautiful job. Well, uh, the second or the third major goal of the program, and read it with me, experience increased comprehension and facility with text-dependent comprehension questions. Now, we focus on text-dependent questions, which means that, and you know it, uh, text-dependent questions, so they read a certain amount, we ask them a question, and the question is one uh, that they have had to uh, extract from what they've read the answer uh, and uh, or make an inference based on using their knowledge and what is in the text, but it is dependent on the text. Now, this is really important. I want to make this point for you because we used to say you need to ask questions that connect the student to the content but you also need to ask questions uh, that connect the content to their personal experience. So we often ask questions like, have any of you had a similar experience? Does anybody uh, know why this occurred? What, does anybody know? And uh, here's the problem with those questions. Uh, though we taught, taught teachers for years to be certain to ask uh, questions that connected uh, the text to their personal experience. What it does though, is that it takes their cognition out of the text. Uh, and so they're thinking about their own experience. They're thinking about what they already have known and they're not thinking about what's in the text. And we actually know that those kind of questions could be useful after we've read something, but not while we're reading it because it removes their cognition from the text. So I always teach teachers ask questions that keep them in the text, not out of the text. You got your hands ready to gesture with me? In the text, not out of the text. In the text, not out of the text. Excellent job joining me. Now, this is very similar uh, to the third recommendation uh, of the IS practice guide. And read it with me and go. Routinely use a set of comprehension building practices to help students make sense of the text. So next time we meet, we'll look at this in more depth, but where the students uh, will have a strategy, they're going to read uh, a passage, a paragraph in a passage uh, one time silently, then they're going to read it again uh, with the teacher, and then they're going to be asked a question and given a sentence starter, and then they're going to locate the answer and say or write the answer. So that is the uh, set of comprehensive building practices that we've embedded into rewards. And we do know uh, that they're going to be finding and justifying their answers. And we know that if they respond to text-dependent questions, that it will increase their comprehension, not just on this passage, but that practice also strengthens it and generalizes to other passages. So they can decode words, they can read with automaticity or fluency, and they can answer text-dependent questions. Uh, and Along with this, though, we teach vocabulary. And that's exactly what the IS Practice Guide suggested, uh, that we would build students world and word knowledge so they can make sense of the text. Uh, so uh, we are teaching vocabulary that is embedded in the text when we read passages. And vocabulary. You know, I just had uh, some principals asked me when I was in Montana, uh, what are the most important things that we do with our intermediate students? And I said, well, if we're going to get down to what would make the most difference, number one, is that we have lots of active participation so that they are saying things, writing things, and doing things throughout the lesson. And in every class, 
in math and science and social studies and language arts that we teach vocabulary. Because indeed, one of the most enduring findings in reading research is the extent to which students' vocabulary knowledge relates to their reading comprehension. So we teach vocabulary, and I'm going to introduce you to how we teach that today. But look how important vocabulary is. We know it is related to comprehension, uh, but uh, one of the researchers I really admire is Nagy, uh, who did a study finding that uh, adequate reading comprehension depends on the person already knowing between 90 to 90% of the words in a text. So you have to know the meaning of a lot of words in order to comprehend the text. So we teach vocabulary and also model within the program how we might teach vocabulary in other uh, situations. Well, we know we should do it because direct instruction has proven to be very effective. Uh, basically, uh, here is what we know about vocabulary gains. That when we look at students in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, the majority of words that they add to their personal lexicon are words that a teacher has taught. They learn some words from what they read, but in the primary or in those intermediate grades, most of the words have been directly taught. Uh, and it's a very effective way to improve comprehension is to ensure that you know the meaning of the words. And finally, the last goal is to improve spelling. Oh my goodness, uh, this is a critical goal. Sometimes when I am doing demonstration lessons with intermediate students or middle school students, I just am appalled at the lack of spelling skill because we haven't put enough energy into spelling. And I bet there's not one person on this webinar who hasn't had to write something down today, hasn't had to use their spelling skills. Uh, and so for the words that we teach them to read, we also do dictation to teach them to spell those words. Uh, and so ah, the IS practice guide said, uh, embed spelling in the lesson. And that's exactly what we do. So every lesson we dictate words that the students have to slow down and say segment into the oral parts and then write each part uh, and then look at it to be certain that it makes sense. Well, we know this makes a difference because as I mentioned before, there is this reciprocal nature. When I read multisyllabic words, I have to know the prefix and the suffixes and the vowel sounds uh, to read the words that are unfamiliar. And when I go to spell a multisyllabic word, I have to know the prefixes and how they're spelled and the suffixes and the vowel sounds. So uh, we do know that if I teach decoding, it will improve spelling. If I teach spelling, it will improve decoding. Um, but we also uh, know that it, if it's taught well, spelling does lead to better reading. And finally, uh, this one is just a reminder to automaticity that if spelling is automatic, I can put my cognitive resources uh, on uh, higher level aspects of the composition, uh, content that I want to explain. So here is a summary. And I'm gonna have you study it for a minute so that you could tell someone else uh, the beige of things that are taught in rewards. How to decode multisyllabic words. How to read with appropriate rate. Uh, how to uh, teach vocabulary and how to learn vocabulary. And have uh, comprehension how to respond to questions that are text dependent uh, and being able to spell multisyllabic words. So here's what I want you to do. If I was in your fourth grade class, 
one thing that I would teach students is when you want to learn something, there's two things you have to do. You have to rehearse the information and then you have to retrieve it from memory. You have to rehearse and retrieve. Everybody say that with me with the actions. Rehearse and retrieve from memory. Rehearse and retrieve. And I teach them to rehearse in a very overt manner so that uh, they are looking at this and they're saying, okay, you have to be able to decode multisyllabic words. Uh, you have to read fluently. Uh, you have to have vocabulary uh, and be able to answer text dependent questions and be able to spell multisyllabic words. So I actually have them touch their fingers and you think, oh, they'll think that's weird, but it makes it more overt as they rehearse it. And then they have to uh, retrieve the information without the structure. So take a moment and study this and then we will retrieve it. Okay. And so uh, first they have to be able to decode multisyllabic words. And then they have to read with fluency uh, and they have to have vocabulary uh, and comprehension, uh, particularly of text dependent questions and spelling. Now, what I just modeled there is what I would do if I wanted them to learn any information, that there has to be a way that they could study it or rehearse it themselves, but then they have to be able to retrieve it from memory. Uh, and then we have deeper neural pathways that lead to retention. Just remember this, that we define learning as it moves from working memory to permanent memory. And so if I wanted to move from working memory to permanent memory, then we need rehearsal and retrieval. Rehearsal and retrieval, rehearsal and retrieval. Now, uh, just yesterday, uh, I did this with another group and I did that. And they said, how did you do that? Okay, so this is just a tiny little teacher hint. If you use a PowerPoint, uh, and you have this on the screen and you want the students to retrieve it with no scaffolding, then touch W for whiteout. Or maybe you wanna to touch B for blackout. Now don't let that be the best thing you learned today, but it is a cool thing to know because it allows you to do retrieval practice. We're gonna take five right now. Uh, and when we come back, uh, we are going to uh, look at the research findings and then look at the program itself. So take five and then be back in your seat. Uh, when five minutes are off, I'll set my timer. And this would be a great time to put questions in for Sarah, because when we come back, we'll start with questions. You'll set your going So welcome back in the back of the manual. Uh, you're going to find a review of research that's been directly done on rewards. And this is just a quick summary uh, so you know what the findings of those many studies will be. One was, yes, when rewards was taught, there was significant gains in the ability to decode unknown long words. Ah, the first goal of the program. And there were significant increases in fluency the second goal of the program. And we taught it both in tier two classes and tier three of an RTI program so that uh, the students uh, made significant gains in those environments. And we have studies that were done in rural communities, suburban communities, and urban communities. It did not seem to matter uh, where these students lived, what community they were in. Uh, rewards was powerful enough to make a difference across those groups, including uh, English language learners. Uh, and 
So we had many, we took out the data of students who at some time in their career had been designated in student learning an additional language, an English language learner, uh, and they made significant gains. And we looked at the research that included students with learning disabilities and they made significant gains. Uh, and uh, we had one major study that looked at using it not just as an intervention, which is what is mostly done with small groups and intervention, but as uh, a intervention for all fourth graders in a district. And this was done uh, through the University of Washington. Uh, and what was interesting is that all students of different reading levels uh, made significant gains. Uh, and so that the students that were the highest performing students in the class made the most gains, which doesn't surprise me at all. The more you know, the more you gain. The students that were middle readers made significant gains in uh, fluency and in accuracy of reading multisyllabic words. And the lowest performing students in the class made significant gains in terms of accuracy, which always is a, a forerunner to fluency. All right, well, with that, we're going to get down to some of the details in teaching it. Uh, and don't forget, as we continue, your questions are warmly welcomed by Sarah. So just put them in uh, the chat box. So who is the program designed for and how are they determined? Well, uh, who are they designed for? For students that are in fourth, fifth, and sixth grade, that's where many of you teach, who have mastered the skills that are normally taught in kindergarten, first and second grade, so that they already have some background but are struggling to be able to read fourth grade material, fifth grade material, sixth grade material. So it's for students who generally read at the third grade level or above, but uh, still do not read at grade level. Okay, you got these students in mind. Uh, I know that our fourth grade and fifth grade teachers do. And one indicator that they probably read at the third grade level, uh, because if they don't read, if they're still reading at the first grade level, there's other programs like phonics for reading that would be more appropriate uh, than rewards. So one indicator that they read probably at the third grade level uh, would be their fluency. So we usually recommend that they uh, read at least 60 correct words per minute. We want to get them up to like 120 correct words per minute. Um, and so uh, we have students that have some knowledge of reading from the primary grades. They read about the third grade level or higher. It worked very well with kids who read the fourth or fifth grade level. Uh, because it improved their decoding and their fluency. Uh, and uh, finally, it's those students that you know would benefit from uh, advanced decoding, uh, work on fluency, and vocabulary instruction. So how might you figure this out? Well, uh, we need some kind of measure of their current reading level. And you could utilize basically any data that's already been collected that would give you an idea if they could read words at the third grade level uh, so that they would be able to profit from rewards. Uh, we include a assessment that is right uh, in the teacher's manual and on the online material uh, that is called the San Diego Quick. So if you don't have other data, like from uh, the Woodcock uh, reading that many school site people might have administered to a students or the Gates or the Piot, uh, then you could use the San Diego Quick just to give us a rough estimate. And it's just a screening test uh, to give us a rough estimate of their reading level. So let's look at the San Diego Quick. If you didn't have another one, but you just needed uh, an idea of their current uh, decoding. So um, you can see here that they have, this is the teacher copy 
uh, that there are lists of words uh, that the students are going to read. Uh, and uh, the way that you do this one, you usually start uh, with uh, second grade uh, and they read the words. Uh, and if they don't have consistent errors, then you move to the next grade. Uh, and if they don't have consistent errors, you move to the next. And all of the uh, administration procedures are listed in the manual. But this is a useful test to have around anyway. You get a new student and you want a quick idea of their decoding. Uh, you could have them read these graded um, lists. All right. So that's just a screener. Uh, we also would like uh, to have a one minute fluency uh, that we could have measured at the beginning and the end. So this is can be both a screener as well as formative assessment. Now I'm gonna bet that there's something at your school that you're already using. Maybe you use Dibbles, maybe you use uh, Ames Web to measure fluency throughout the year so that you have progress monitoring of all of your students. So you could use that data. If you don't have uh, that data available, uh, then we provide a passage uh, in the teacher's manual and on online materials so you could download it of a passage that you could use at the beginning of teaching before you start teaching rewards and afterwards. So it would be a part of the formative assessment. Uh, but if you have Ames Web or Divils and you're already collecting that data, use it before and after. Uh, or you could just utilize a grade level expository text passage that's available to you and you could use that. So here is the one that you'll find uh, in the back of your teacher's guide as well as online in which you're going to read the title to students, and then you're going to direct them to read this uh, and that they should read it accurately and uh, quickly. So let's just do a little test here. And so you can look at the screen or you can look at your own materials. Uh, and I read this with you, George Schuster and the great auto race. And now we're right here and the students are going to read it for a minute. You're going to read it for a minute because I just want to teach you how to use the way this is set up. So let me just get my timer up here and you're going to read and I'm going to read uh, for uh, one minute. Okay, reading it out loud uh, and when I say stop, circle the last word that you read, except you had to do it sort of virtually on the screen. So beginning reading and go. Okay, stopping there. And um, so, I'm certain that many of you have done fluency measures before. And so you know why this is set up this way. This is the number of cumulative words uh, that they have read. So if you were to count the words up to this point, there was nine. 
And if you count it on, we're at 21. This is to make it easy for you to figure out the number of words read per minute. And so uh, I read two, uh, the word automobile, which was 144. And so then uh, if I had made errors, maybe I made uh, three errors, you would subtract it and I would have 141 correct words. Now, when we look at the passages in the next time we meet, we also do this with students so that they are reading a, they are reading uh, also, and uh, they are reading to a partner. And uh, if they got to hear, the partner would circle the word and then they would use this number to count on. So they don't have to count all 109 words. They go 109, 110, 111, 112. So this is used as a pre and a post test of fluency. But again, if you already have fluency data, you can utilize it. Now, there's one more test that is utilized pre and post test. Uh, and this was just to see formative growth. And that is a one minute uh, test of multisyllabic oral reading. So that the students uh, have these words and they are asked to read for a moment, uh, for a minute. So we get an idea of their current ability to read long words, but it also uh, introduces to the students to the kind of words that they are gonna be able to read uh, through their study of rewards. And you know this is pretty useful. You can say to them, these are the kind of words that when you're finished with rewards, you're gonna be able to say communication, unintentional uh, pronunciation, dissatisfaction, uh, interruption. Now, don't you think uh, that it would be useful for them to see the kind of words that they're going to be able to read. Uh, and so uh, we're going to do a little one for you to read it. But because you only have one page in front of you, not both pages, uh, I'm going to do this uh, just for 30 seconds. Uh, and you might even finish in 30 seconds. So getting ready and let me get my timer set here again. So you're going to read each of these words I'm going down this way and then I'll explain the way the data is taken. Okay, so put your finger under the first word and getting ready and read down the list and go. Okay, stopping there. So they're going to read for a minute and then you're going to be listening to them and you're going to look for uh, the number of words that they read totally correctly. So they might uh, get to 28 words uh, and that would be total words and maybe they missed three of them. Uh, and so that they got 25 words that were correct. But we needed a way to make this much more sensitive. Uh, so they're going to have number of words that are correct or incorrect, but also we are going to measure it by parts that are correct. So if I get maintain, I get uh, two, uh, and so you're going to cross out any incorrect parts. So that's correct. 
uh, pre-10, that's correct, misprint. And then they have this word and they go M per. So they got M right, but not per. Uh, so uh, we cross this one out. So it is just, you know, you know from your stat classes that you took on testing that the more items you have, the more sensitive it is. The fewer items, the less sensitive. And so this gives us more, a better way to be able to compare their growth. Okay, so you end up with uh, the number of correct words per minute, and you end up with the number of correct parts read in a minute. And we do this pre and post. So the main thing is we want to get students that have some skills from their primary grades, but have not transferred those all to multisyllabic words and have lower fluency than we would desire. So that's what we're collecting data on. Okay. So do we have any questions that came in on the assessment? Yes, we have two, <clears throat> pardon me, we have two questions. Yes, Sarah. The first question was um, that at one point you said expository text, it needs to be expository question mark. I guess they're and, asking if it needs to be expository. Ah, uh, yes, it does. It needs to be an informational text, expository text for the one minute timing, uh, not narrative. And the reason is that one thing we want to do is capture their ability to uh, decode multisyllabic words, which are much more likely to occur in informational text than in a narrative text. So excellent question there. And then the next question is in regards to the um, project we just did. And it says, what happens if a student autocorrects? If they immediately uh, correct the word, it's counted as accurate. Okay, but, but it will be reflected in the data because it is number of correct words per minute. And so they've had to sound it out and then they had to correct it. Uh, and so it's going to reduce still, it'll be reflected in their total data. All right. Well, let us move ahead. Where can this program be used? Well, basically I could tell you it could be used anywhere. It could be used in rural areas, suburban areas. Uh, it could be uh, done under the old oak tree. Uh, but uh, what did our research show? Yes, we could teach it in general ed classes to all of the students, particularly in fourth and fifth grade. Uh, and we could uh, teach it uh, in intervention classes uh, that are tier two or tier three. Uh, and we could use it in intensive intervention programs. For example, we had many cases where we taught it in summer school uh, the link just perfect for summer school uh, to get kids better prepared who are struggling readers in fourth and fifth grade. All right. So, uh, and what materials are needed? Well, first of all, uh, you are going to need a teacher's guide. Uh, and this has all the materials you need as we'll look at the individual lessons today uh, and get very good at teaching those lessons. And each student needs a student book. And this student book uh, is consumable because they're going to write in it. Yes, they're going to circle the prefix, circle the suffix, underline the vowels, and sound out the word. So they'll each need a student book. Uh, and they uh, will, you will also need access to online materials. Uh, and there's so there's certain materials that you would get online, for example, copy of the assessments, uh, copy of what are called displays that we're going to see, uh, you would go online and download. So let's look at all three of these. So the teacher's guide, there it is. Uh, first of all, it has a introduction that goes through the information I'm providing to you today in this webinar, but also uh, it provides uh, 
how to get started and step by step on that. So you want to read it. Now, we actually have some studies that show most teachers don't read uh, the front matter before they start teaching a program. And I highly recommend that you read it. Uh, because it will be useful to you in reinforcing what we're doing today and getting started. And the program is divided into units. And, and there is a unit divider that tells you for that unit what preparation needs to be made. So every four to five lessons, there is a unit divider. And there's 25 lessons. Uh, and the pre-skills uh, that are necessary for this strategy uh, are taught in the first uh, 15 lessons. And then the strategy, circle the prefix, circle the suffix, underline the vowels, say the part, say it fast, make it a real word, are taught uh, in the remaining lessons. Uh, and the appendices has many things that are useful for you, including all of the assessments posters, uh, things that uh, you can give students to remind them of the strategies. Um, so here is the example of the uh, unit dividers. This is for unit one, lessons one through five. Uh, and it uh, tells you what is the content of the lessons. But most importantly, uh, it tells you what you need to do before you teach that unit particularly download the lesson the displays, uh, download the displays for the illustrated vocabulary instruction, download uh, the prefix and suffix reviews, and really important, download the checkups, the formative assessment that's done at the end of each of the uh, units. So check that out, particularly the preparation. When we look at the lessons, uh, that there are, in each lesson, there's a number of activities. And we know that struggling students do better when there are short activities. And that's what we did. So there's activity A and B and C and D and E and so forth in every lesson in the first 15 that we're looking at today. Uh, and uh, the publisher did us a beautiful favor uh, and that is they have each activity on a page. Now, publishers do not like white space, but we uh, worked with the company so that this is one activity, and then you look at the next page for the next activity, really helpful to the teacher. And there is an objective at the top of each activity. And then there is a summary, like you get in most con uh, conference, con excuse me, in most curriculum materials, they would give you an activity summary. Do this, then this, then this. Then there is a reproduction of exactly what the students are looking at in their student book. So you have that right there in front of you. And then there is sometimes an icon, see that little icon right there, which says, ah, I need a display for this activity. So that icon means, oh, luckily I went online. I already have downloaded that display that I can put up on the screen. And then there is instructional steps. Now, this is what we might call uh, soft scripting, meaning that we have scripted out the wording that a teacher or paraeducator could utilize in teaching the lesson. Now, we had to do that to ensure that when we did research that every teacher taught it the same way so that the conclusions uh, would be based on uh, the power of the curriculum. But we also found, and the teachers said this, uh, that the scripts are so useful. It's like watching a teacher teach it before I teach it. And it helps me be more consistent with my wording from lesson to lesson to lesson. Now, do you have to do absolutely every word exactly the same? Small changes in it make no difference. Huge changes like do it on your own make a huge difference. 
So it needs to be close, but some modification, particularly as you get more familiar, because for 15 lessons, you're going to teach activity A. 15 lessons, you're going to take activity B. You'll get down the wording of it. Uh, and that is exactly purposeful in that we teach routines that the teacher can learn and do again and again. Now there's one more thing I want you to really attend to, and that is this, the corrections. So for every activity, there is a correction procedure. Most often the correction procedure is this. You hear a student make an error, uh, you stop, you tell them what the correct answer is, uh, and then you guide them in doing that item again and often guide the whole class in doing that item again. But we say the answer uh, and then repeat the item. And, you know, I write books uh, on explicit instruction. So one of the things that we've added when we did this revision uh, is a reminder of the instruction that this is based on and instruction on research. So this is just like a little bonus uh, in terms of reminding us what kind of instruction makes the most difference across subject areas with our students. You're gonna practice these today so you'll get familiar with the layout of each activity. And in the appendix, uh, which is at the back of the book, of course, there's many things that we've already talked about, but you might want to check out the chart of all the prefixes and suffixes and vowel sounds that we teach. There's that quick assessment of their basic reading level. And then there's progress monitoring instead, including uh, the multisyllabic uh, reading uh, fluency, uh, the fluency pre and post test. Uh, and then a summary chart for the students to graph it. Uh, and also it lists active participation chart, uh, a word list uh, of it. You know, and many people have said, you know, Anita, I could teach uh, this strategy tomorrow. Uh, it's so simple. Uh, circle the prefix, circle the suffix, underline the vowels, say the part, say it fast, make it a real word. Yeah, I'll do it tomorrow. But you see, if you look at that strategy, think of all of the pre-skills embedded in it. Circle the prefix. You have to know what a prefix is. You have to know the pronunciation of prefixes. You have to practice circling it. Circle the suffixes. Ooh, you have to know what a suffix is. You have to know how to pronounce the suffixes. You have to be able to circle the suffixes. Underline the vowels, ooh. Now you have to know all of the vowel sounds. Uh, and you have to be able to underline the vowel sounds and you have to be able to sound out that syllable. Uh, and then you have to be able to blend the syllables into a word. And then you have to make it a real word. The problem is that the strategy is simple. The pre-skills are complex. You know how many words the kids will read uh, within this program? 840 multisyllabic words. Wow, that is a lot of practice. That is the amount of practice that was necessary to take the students to automaticity. Okay, and then don't forget, you can read the review of research studies done on rewards at the back. So that's the teacher manual. Then we have the student book and it's consumable. Yeah, because they're gonna write in it and it needs to stay in the classroom, never leaving the classroom so that you'll always have them, uh, whether you're teaching a whole group or a small group. And it is basically the stimuli for all of the lessons. You know, when people look at this, they think, oh, this is a workbook that they're gonna do independently. No, no, no. Uh, this is a totally teacher-directed program. Uh, and so they're not going to work on it independently. This is the stimulus for their lessons. Now, even here, we were cautious about the design of the student book. 
because we looked at what are things that turn off children uh, that make them think it's quote unquote baby stuff. If the font is very large, they have that kind of reaction. So we use normal font. If there were illustrations that had younger children in it, then we had a negative response. So basically there are no illustrations. So we can avoid the, any uh, emotional response to the uh, pictures. Uh, there are pictures when we do vocabulary on the illustrative vocabulary. Uh, and the third thing that was a turnoff for kids, if they were all short little words, not multisyllabic words. Well, there's no problem with that. Uh, so I'm just turning to one lesson that has incomprehensible oh, accountability, individuality, mismanagement, fundamentally, indescribable, essentially, environmentally. Yes, that's what your kids will be able to read when they finish this program. And I bet the fourth and fifth grade teachers who are on today say, whoa, that's exactly what I want. Uh, so, but it was uh, intentionally designed uh, to appeal to struggling readers because it had normal font, it had longer words, and it had no illustrations of younger children. Hmm. Okay, you do need to go online. And so you'll get a code that will give you access to it. And I just have here what you'll pull up uh, online. And then each of these open and have files. For example, you can see that this manual, you'd want to read the lesson before you taught it, but you don't want to carry this home. No problem. Uh, so there is a bookshelf that has the teacher and the student book uh, electronically so that you could study it before you taught the lesson the next day. And then this is the most important. Uh, you have the things that you need to teach each unit. And when you open that, it's gonna look like this, actually. Uh, it'll list the materials uh, that are in that unit. And it'll say, these are the displays that you need to reproduce. This is the checkup that you need to reproduce. So that one has to be looked at and download them before you go to teach the lesson. Just sort of like the problem I had last week when I uh, couldn't get uh, on Wi-Fi. Uh, well, you don't want to uh, teach a lesson and say, ooh, let me go on Wi-Fi and you can't do it. So you need to download them in advance. All the screening tests uh, are available in the appendices, but also online. And there are charts and posters uh, that are also available uh, and some additional information on training. So very great resources, particularly the bookshelf and by unit. And so we have online displays that are necessary for the lesson. Remember that icon, it says, do you have a display? and you need to download them before the lesson. And there are vocabulary lessons with PowerPoints. In fact, many teachers said, oh, wow, we love those vocabulary lessons. We have, uh, for the whole program, uh, we have uh, 25 vocabulary lessons. Uh, and one teacher told me, you know, when the principal's coming around and doing observations, I always do the vocabulary because they're very impressed by what the students are learning and the displays. Uh, and this one is very critical. At the end of our day, we'll look at it, but there is progress monitoring. So every four to five lessons, there is a formal checkup. Uh, and there's two things that were really important in our data, because when we added formal checkups and the students knew, knew that they were gonna be held accountable uh, they are much more intentional about learning. So it really was motivating to them. But also it gave feedback to the teacher on what parts of the program they needed to teach 
better, which parts were going very, very well, uh, what kind of extra practice the students might need. Um, and so I'm often asked this, if I go download it, how might I put it on the screen? Uh, you have to be able to put it on the screen uh, so you can write on the screen. Now, you're gonna have to forgive me. This I'm doing this at home and the windows in my house are open because it's cool out and it's gonna be a hot day. And I'm hoping that uh, you will not have this continue much longer, but we do have this real thing that this is a neighborhood in downtown Portland, Oregon, and the garbage people have come. Uh, so first of all, maybe you use an interactive uh, whiteboard, like a smart board, and then you can simply download it into that platform and show it on the screen and be able to underline and circle uh, on uh, the interactive whiteboard. Now, some of you uh, may have a tablet such as the one that I have here, my iPad, and I have downloaded an app that allows me to use my tablet as an interactive. Uh, they have probable cause plus plus. We have all kinds of things going on here. Here, uh, so we could download that interactive app on a tablet. Number three is you could download it into your computer and project it just in a mounted whiteboard, but you could still go up and write on the whiteboard, wipe it off, and then have the next display come up. Many teachers had a document camera in their room. So they just made a print copy of it, put it under the document camera, showed it up there and then said, watch me circle the prefix, circle the suffix, underline the vowel. But you have to be able to write and they could do it that way. Now, some of you are saying, I'm gonna teach like a group of three. It seems uh, a little ludicrous to have a big screen. And yes, all you could do is print it, put it on a clipboard and hold it up in front of your small group. So you've got to pick an option, but they have to have the displays and you have to be able to write on them. Well, we are going to uh, look at how we teach this program. And then after we have a break, we're going to practice it. So this is directly from your teacher's manual, but I wanted to show it because this program is based on the science of reading. Uh, we know what students need in order to be able to decode words. We know all the studies that have been done on multisyllabic words. But if we don't use the best instruction along with it and use the science of learning and the science of instruction, they go together. So because uh, I write books on instruction, uh, we followed the principles of explicit instruction in the book that I wrote uh, with Charles Hughes at Penn State. And our principal one is provide systematic instruction. Uh, yes, all students deserve systematic instruction, but struggling students must have systematic instruction. They are not going to discover it. If they've discovered it, you never meet them in an intervention group. They need it broken down uh, into obtainable pieces, all the curriculum, and then it needs to be taught very explicitly. So I'm gonna bet that you are familiar with, I do it, we do it, you do it. Now those are terms that in 1974, I wrote an article that coined those terms. At that time, uh, one of the premier educators in the United States was Madeline Hunter. And she talked about demonstration, guided practice, and checking for understanding. Ah, I do it. Demonstration, we do it. Guided practice, you do it. Checking for understanding. So I coined those terms, which are now ubiquitous, 
uh, basically to capture in terms that were memorable, uh, those steps of demonstration, guided practice and checking for understanding. So when we teach a skill or strategy, you will see this embedded uh, in the scripts. When we teach vocabulary, you're going to see that we use a systematic routine where we introduce the word and its pronunciation. We introduce the meaning using a student-friendly explanation. We uh, illustrate it um, by giving verbal or visual examples, and then we check their understanding. So we have routines for strategy instruction, routine for vocabulary instruction. But you already know, just from what we've already talked about, that I'm very committed to us eliciting frequent responses. Students will say things together. Students will say things to their partners. Students will write down answers. So systematic instruction with frequent responses. And we're going to listen carefully to those responses. We're going to carefully monitor those responses and they're going to give them feedback. Feedback could be specific praise. Excellent, you read all of the words accurately. Good job, you said every part of that word. Excellent, your spelling uh, was carefully written, it was legible and it was accurate. Specific praise or corrections. That word is bad, what word? Bad, sound it out with me, bad, what word? Bad. So we monitor, listen, look carefully and then either give corrections or specific praise. And if we're gonna keep their attention, we gotta have it move along with a brisk pace. And we're gonna have judicious practice, enough practice to move it from uh, working memory to permanent memory. 840 words, I just counted them, uh, to say how many words would the students have for practice? Well, now, of course, these would be very good guidelines for effective instruction way beyond rewards. Systematic instruction, frequent responses, monitor and give feedback, a brisk perky pace and judicious, just enough practice for it moving into permanent memory. Well, so we are going to uh, look at how we teach these lessons, one through 15. But we are going to, this is a little bit early, but it's perfect. Uh, we are going to take uh, a little bit early lunch. Uh, we have designated 30 minutes for lunch and we're gonna do it now uh, so that we can start with a new practice afterwards. Does that work for you, Sarah? Yes, it is. And now, Sarah, do we have any questions that came in that I could firm up before we move ahead? We do. We have three questions. Well, let's answer those questions, then we'll take our lunch break. All right. Sounds good. We have some of our intermediate school students are scoring below the third grade level in reading ability. Do you recommend that we use a different program such as phonics for reading as an intervention for even our fifth through eighth grade students if they are unable to read a 60 word per minute accurate, accurately? So if I'm teaching a intervention group, a small group of struggling students and uh, we have many students who read below third grade level, then yes, I would probably use something like phonics for reading and they might place, there's three levels of it, level uh, A, B, and C, and they might place probably in B or C before they went into rewards. Now, uh, if I was doing a whole class, like at the beginning of fourth grade, as that study that was done at University of Washington did, then I might have some students that did read below because I'm gonna teach it with the whole class. Uh, and luckily all levels of students, the highest performing, the middle performing students and the lowest students did well. But normally if I was teaching intervention and I had students that were 
uh, below third grade. Uh, and then I would say to myself, uh, I need to give them more skills before they join rewards. And you could see that in terms of the multisyllabic words you saw on that multisyllabic word reading test. Uh, whoa, there's a lot of pre-skills there. I need to give more background knowledge before we go into rewards. What's our next question, Ms. Sarah? Yes, let's see. Um, someone was curious what the name of the app was that you mentioned that you used on your tablet for the displays. I am going to uh, get that. I don't have it right in front of me, but uh, I will look into that. Uh, I mean, I just have to pull it up, but I'll do that during our lunchtime and give you right when we come back. Okay. And we did have one more pop-up. So we have two um, more questions. It's um, one is, could this be used with on a grade level or above grade level second, third graders to give them a leg up on multisyllabic word reading? So uh, it wasn't designed for, but it's been used often at the end of third grade to give them a step up before they went into fourth grade. Uh, and um, I would see no problem with that at all. At the end of the year, things are going to be much more difficult in fourth grade, and so we're going to prepare for it. And it's very systematic. Uh, and so uh, if the students had been well taught, as we often are in Michigan schools, decoding skills in uh, kindergarten, first and second grade and third grade, then it could be appropriately used. Okay, and we have one last question. It says, yes. are, are we able to use NWEA reading as a screening tool as well? Uh, yes, you could because it would give you an idea of their basic reading skills and it includes fluency. All right, we're good? We are good, that was the last question. So uh, you are going to have a half hour break. I will see you then. I'm gonna have breakfast because it's 8.30 here, not quite 8.30, 8.17. Uh, and I'll be back with you uh, in 30 minutes. Enjoy, and we'll pick it right up here. And rest of our day, we're going to practice teaching the different activities, uh, exactly which will lead into uh, the first 15 lessons that you teach. Thanks for being so present. Enjoy your time, and goodbye. So welcome uh, to uh, on the next part of our training, which is actually teaching the lessons. But I want us to have a solid background of why this program is important, what the goals were. Uh, and so I'm gonna take, uh, give you a second to remember the five major goals of the program. Okay, so that we would improve students' ability to read multi-slavic words, uh, to improve their fluency, to add to their vocabulary, uh, and uh, to uh, also include comprehension, particularly of text-dependent questions where they'd have to search and find the answers, uh, and vocabulary, and finally spelling. So we have those in place, and we're going to look at the first 15 lessons. Remember that uh, they usually take about 50 minutes, so it might be two 30-minute sessions uh, that you would be teaching them. Uh, and this is the way the program is designed, that basically what we did in the first 15, minute, first 15 lessons is ask ourselves, what are the pre-skills that students need in order to learn the strategy that we know, circle the prefixes, circle the suffixes, underline the vowels, say the parts, say them quickly and make it a real word. So you have it in mind. So the first 15 lessons basically were a task analysis. They need to do this, they need to do this. And so we teach those in short activities uh, that take five minutes or less each activity. And they are repeated with cumulative practice across 15 lessons. So just a quick preview, giving you a mental map. So if you were to open up the manual 
and look at each of the first 15 lessons, they have these activities uh, that the students learn how to listen to parts of the word and blend it into an entire word. Ah, a preschool necessary uh, for sounding out multisyllabic words. And they have to locate the vowels within words. And so they are taught vowel combinations like A-I is A, A-Y is A. They are taught vowel conversions uh, that when you have a single vowel, uh, you could first try the sound and if it doesn't make a real word, you try the name. Aha. Uh -huh. And that they could read parts of real words that contain vowels. So all of this is that one premise that every syllable in a word has a vowel and you need to know the vowel sounds and you need to know, to, need to know how to blend those sounds into a syllable. And they have an activity which we'll look at where they have uh, a word that is close, but not perfect uh, to a word and how you make it a real word. So this is just what are the skills necessary? And then um, ah, the other premise was that 80% of multisyllabic words have a prefix or suffix. So we peel off the prefix, peel off the suffix. We've got to learn how to pronounce them. We need to be able to circle them and locate them in words. And we're gonna learn the meanings of high frequency prefix and suffixes. And then we are going to do spelling in every lesson so that we slow the word down and write meaningful parts with the word. We're going to learn vocabulary uh, from that uh, of four words uh, that we've learned in the lesson. So that's the big picture. Uh, and let me tell you, after you've taught each part of this for 15 times, you'll get down the routine, you'll get down the wording, and you'll get down the corrections. So I took the first lesson, and we're going to look at it together so that you are ready to go when you need to and want to teach this program. So the very first activity, activity A, uh, the students learn how to blend parts of the word together. Now, why did we teach this? Well, when we watch students, they would often go re, con, sid, er. And we'd say, okay, now read it fast. Re, can, sid, or now read it really fast. Re, can, sid, er. <laughs> and, and eventually we'd say the word is reconsider. What word? Reconsider. In other words, many of the students had difficulty uh, blending the parts of the word into a real word. So we actually practice this. And we also wanted to start the lesson with something for which they would be successful. Uh, and so we started with blending the parts of a word into a real word. So what does it look like in your teacher's manual? Well, when you look in the teacher's manual, you're going to find a consistent organization for each activity and each will be on a different page. Uh, and First, you'll have the student objective to blend orally presented word parts into words. And then an activity. So you're going to say each word, pausing between the word parts, and students are going to blend the parts together and say the whole word. So this gives you a big idea of what's happening in activity A. And then you have the uh, wording, the instructional steps written out. And the instructional steps, uh, the black print is what you're going to say, and the color orange in your book is what you're going to do. So my turn to teach this, and then we'll teach it together just to give us an idea of how these lessons work. So I say, turn to page three. I pause and students open up to page three. Listen. I'm going to say the parts of a word 
and you're going to say the whole word. Listen carefully. Tea, spoon, full. What word? Teaspoonful. Say it again. Teaspoonful. I'll say the parts. You say the word. Listen. As, tro, not. What word? Astronaut. Now here, since they're looking at me, I'm using a signal to have them say it together. So I hold up my hand so that I'm telling them, don't say it yet. What word? Teaspoonful. Right, so uh, you say, oh God, I think I'll skip this activity. My kids could certainly do this. And I'm gonna tell you, don't skip anything uh, if you want the program to work. Because first of all, you'll have some students who need to practice saying the whole word so that they would sound it out and they'll go tea, spoon, full. And you say, say the word and they go tea, spoon, full, not teaspoonful. So this is an important skill of blending the parts together. But here is the reason you wanna do this. Many of your students have never said, or even in some cases heard the word tornado or reconsider or comprehend or professional. And so these are words that they're going to later read in the material. So we're just setting them up for, for success by introducing the words in an oral activity before we have it down the road in a decoding activity. So looking up here, always read the corrections. If students leave out a word part or mispronounce the whole word, say the word and have them repeat it. Okay, so now I just modeled this, but we are going to teach these together. So you're very familiar with it. Uh, and so follow the cursor, teach it with me, talk out loud, turn to page three. Pause, check them out to see if they're on page three. Continue. Listen, I'm going to say the parts of a word. You're going to say the whole word. Listen carefully. Tea, spoon, full. What word? Teaspoonful. Yes, teaspoonful. Continue. I'll say the parts. You say the word. Teacher talk. Now, one of the things that we do is we reduce, reduce the number of words in our directives, making it more, more efficient. So, you know, we always talk about the gradual release of responsibility in terms of turning more responsibility over the students. But there's another way that we have to change the lessons over time, and that is to reduce the verbalizations to make it more efficient. Okay, so let's try that again. I'll say the parts, you say the word, listen. Ask, tro, not. What word? Astronaut. Maybe you're even practicing a signal. That would be helpful. All right. So this activity uh, extends to the first 15 lessons so that the students will have practice uh, making it a real word. All right. Remember that the next set of, less, of activities uh, involve vowel sounds. So let's do just a little bit of review before we go forward. So first we have single vowel letters. Now, many children have been introduced to what was referred to as short sounds and long sounds, but we found children that were confused by that terminology. And let me show you why. So they are taught, let's say, the short sound of the letter A. A. Or the long sound for the letter A. A. Now I ask you, which was longer? They are exactly the same length. They are the length of your breath because they are continuous sounds. Sounds. Uh, so, a, a. So, no wonder the students are confused. So, we use a little bit different language. First, we found 
that the students knew the names of these letters, A-I-O-U-E. So we taught them, first try the sound, a, ah, and if that doesn't make a real word, try the name, a. So first try the sound, a, ah, then try the name, a. First try the sound, and it is I, then say the name, which is I. First try the sound, ah, and the name is O. Sound, a, uh, name, U. Sound, e, eh, name, E. Now, when we analyze the error of students, the most consistent challenge they had was with the uh, short sounds, the sounds of these letters. So you may find that you need to have more practice on the sounds. So let's do the sounds one more time and I will repeat it afterwards. Sound, a, ah. sound, i, sound, a, ah. sound, a, ah. sound, e. Ah. Excellent. But the students also are going to learn uh, these uh, combinations, vowel combinations. And so you know these, many of them, of course. Uh, but let's just do a review. I'll say the sound, then you sound the sound, say the sound. A Y A, sound A. A I A, sound A. A U A. -ah sound ah then we have our controlled vowels and uh, er sound er what sound er i r er u r er a r r o r or then we have the configuration when we have a letter with an e uh, at the end of the syllable or word, and it is the name. So these are easy to pronounce. What name? A and O and I and E and U. Perfect. And other vowel combinations. O, I, OI. Uh, what sound? OI. O Y, oi, what sound? Oi. E, 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 what sound? E, o, a, o, what sound? O. O, u, ow, put my cursor there, what sound? Ow. O, w, and now here we have a vowel combination that has more than one fairly frequent sound. So uh, we taught both the major and the minor sound when vowels uh, had high frequency of both. Uh, if there was a major sound that had a very rare minor sound, we did not teach it. We just tell teachers, teach them the whole word. Because if we particularly, some have like four minor sounds, but We've actually reduced, the, in fact, they might remember the major sound if we taught all of those. So variant sounds, we only taught the minor sounds that had high frequency of occurrence. So O-W, as in low, is O, what sound? O. O-W, as in down, is what sound? Ow. We actually teach the kids here, uh, T, try first the sound O, and if it doesn't make a real word, try OW, because O is actually slightly more frequent occurrence than OW, uh, as in down OW. So first try the sound O, and if it doesn't make a word, then try OW. Same with OO. OO uh, -O as in moon would be OO. What sound? OO. An O O as in book would be uh. One day I had sixth graders stand up and they went ooh, uh, ooh, uh, ooh, uh. 
you got to find your joy when you can. Uh, and we had EA, uh, its major sound as in meat is E, its minor sound as in thread is E. First try E, and if it didn't make a real word, try E. So, you know, your students may have been introduced uh, to some of these or many of them uh, in their previous grades, but they may not have had enough practice to make it automatic. You know, and you can't sort of know these sounds. You have to know them with automaticity if you're going to utilize them as a tool in decoding an unfamiliar word. So we teach them. Um, and we teach the minor sounds of these letters, and we teach them the major and minor sounds for O, W, O, O, U, U, and for E, A, E, E. Um, so for some students, it might be review. For some students, it would be new knowledge, but we're going to give them lots of practice. And let's teach the first lesson on this together. And again, you see, we've got the objective, the summary, the student book right there in front of you. So you don't even need a student book to look at. Uh, and uh, we are going to teach this one together. Uh, so keep your voice with mine. Find activity B. You pause, continue. You are going to learn some sounds. You may know some of them already. Now let's just look at that, sound, that sentence. You may know some of them already. So one of the important things that we do in teaching uh, is anticipate what might happen and take it before it ever occurs. So some students right away might say, ooh, this is baby stuff, this is baby stuff. So we are recognized they might do that so we pre-correct it. You may know some of these already. And we have little corrections written into the scripts in anticipation what the response might be. It's one of the best management rules we could use too. If you expect it, pre-correct it, everybody. If you expect it, pre-correct it. Remember I told you about how we looked at what turned kids off or older students with remedial materials? If it had large font, if it had short words, if it had pictures uh, that had young children in it, that turned them off. We expected that. So we pre-corrected it. We had normal font. Uh, we had long words and we had no illustrations. So it's just a... Uh, instructional and a behavioral rule we could use all the time. If you expect it, pre-correct it. Okay, so going down to number two and teaching with me and go. Look at the box. Point to the letters A, Y. The sound of these letters is usually A. What sound? A. Now, how are you going to get them to say it together? You could use you have to have some kind of signal for them. You could use a signal like what sound, and they said at the end they would say it, or you could say what sound, everyone, and they would say A. Or another possibility is you could tap for a sound. Lots of teachers do this. They have a clicker that they might use uh, or a pin like that. Uh, what sound, everyone, A. Point to the letters A-I. The sound of these letters is usually A. What sound? Everyone. And the students are taught to wait to say it there. So we can get everybody in a beautiful choir to say it together. So this needs some kind of auditory signal. Could be everyone. It could be a, a tap. Uh, it could be if you had a clicker, you click for it uh, so the students are saying it together. Okay, let's do the next one together and everybody. Go back to the beginning of the line. Say the sounds again. What sound? A, good. Next sound? A. Now I will tell you, you do not want to get in the habit of always saying it with them. 
Uh, and so I'm teaching it with you. So I'm saying the sounds, but uh, we want to say next sound and listen to their answer. Because if we say it always with them, we're scaffolding it too much. All they're going to do is look at you, not the letter, uh, in order to get the critical information. So watch yourself that you're not saying it. Now, what I often do is this. Okay, watch this. Go back to the beginning of the line. Say the sounds again. Uh, what sound, everyone? Yes, A. Next sound. Everyone, yes, A. So I will hear them say it and then I'll give feedback. Yes, A, a very effective strategy so that you could give immediate feedback right there on what it should have been. So they're hearing it one more time. All right, correction. Don't forget to read the corrections. If students mispronounce a vowel sound, Say the sound and have students repeat it. All right, so almost all of our corrections are tell them the correct answer and then repeat the item. Now, we just looked at lesson one where they're learning AY and AI, but that's obviously not enough practice on AI and AY. Remember, judicious practice, enough practice that they'll remember it. So what we do is use cumulative review. So let's just see how that might look. So this is lesson two, and they're being introduced to AU as in sauce. We put the key words there so you'd be certain to pronounce it correctly. So AU as in sauce, the sound is ah. And then they are going to have a review. What sound? Ah. What sound? Yes, A. What sound? Yes, A. What sound? Ah. So notice that we immediately have cumulative practice. And then if we hop down to lesson five, where we're introducing uh, the configuration of a vowel with a final E, but then when we look here at the cumulative review, we're still seeing AI embedded here, AY embedded here. So that it's not just in one session, but it is spread out. Basically, you know the term, space practice. Space practice that is cumulative, uh, that gives them enough repetitions to move it to permanent memory. And that is our goal with everything we teach. We can even follow it in lesson six. We still see um, A, Y, A, I, with the other sounds that they have learned. And even when we get up to lesson 11, now you might wonder, what is this? Well, what sound, ah, and what sound? Remember, U and U. Uh. And so they'll first try ooh, when it has a square around it, it means it has two sounds. So they're gonna say the major and the minor sound. Ooh, and what other sound? Uh. What sound? Oi. What sound? R. And O-W, they're going to say the sound for it, uh, which the most common sound is O, and the other one as in down is ow. Well, okay, so vowel conversion. So we have first all of these lessons firming up, firming up the pre-skill of vowels. We have looked at um, combinations and learning those, but we also uh, teach them the short sound for each of these and the name. Uh, and sound is a, name is a sound is i, name is i, sound is a, name is o, sound is a, name is u, sound is e, name is e. So 
a member. Why would I go over this again? Because this is where they had the most difficulty. Uh, so we introduce in the first lesson, uh, a, uh, and we introduce its other sound, which is a, and introduce i and i. Are we going to have cumulative review? Absolutely. So let's teach this one together using our perky pace. It would be helpful before you uh, teach it that you read it so that you're clear about the language. All right, everybody, find activity C. Are you teaching it with me? Let's go back and try again. Find activity C. Pause. Continue. continue. When you are reading words and see these letters, First, try the sound. If it doesn't make a real word, then try the name. So we teach them first try the sound, then try the name. First try the sound, then try the name. Continue. Point to the first letter. The sound, as in cat, is a. Ah. What sound? A. Ah. The name, as in labor, is a. What name? A. Point to the next letter. The sound, as in sit, is I. What sound? I. The name, as in pilot, is I. What name? I. First letter again. What sound? Yes, a. What name? A. Yes, A. Next letter, what sound? I. What name, everyone? I. All right. So first try the sound, then try the name. First try the sound, then try the name. Well, the next thing is the students have to read uh, syllables that have a vowel sound. So now we're not talking here about prefix suffixes, but uh, vowel, vowels within the syllables. So here's what we learned from early reading instruction. Now I can look back, since this is the 55th year that I've taught, I can look back and remember how we taught early decoding uh, in kindergarten, first and second grade. We would, at that point, we taught children all the sounds in the alphabet and we taught them to say the sound when they saw the letter. So I could walk into a first grade and the kids could point and they could say with the alphabet, Abba Kafada, but they couldn't read any words because the guidelines then was to teach all 26 letters and then introduce words. Oh, we learned right away that that was not the best possibility. That is, as soon as they learned a few sounds, we should put them into short words so that they could see why they're learning those sounds. So we would uh, teach a, ah, and then we might introduce m, m, mm, and already we're going to have them sound out am. And then we introduce the letter s, s. Uh, and then we sound out the word Sam. So we learn, as soon as we've learned letters, put them into words. So we are learning the, or reintroducing and strengthening the vowel sounds. Uh, and, but we said, if we put them into short words, uh, since these students already have some reading experience, that they might know that word by sight and not have to actually use decoding. So we said, well, let us practice it in syllables taken from real words so that we could prepare them for reading those same syllables within words. Aha. So for example, uh, they sound this out and they go pleat, pleat. Well, you can tell that's probably from a word like Complete uh, or crim, crim, and all. So these are parts of real words. 
but it gives them a chance to practice uh, within the context of a part of a word, the vowel sounds we have taught. So they're not nonsense words, they're parts of real multisyllabic words that they are gonna read later on in the program. So what we're doing is constantly setting them up for success. They need these sounds, so we teach them. They need to be able to sound them out within syllables that are not real words, so we practice that. Okay, so let us teach this together. Now, now you're getting down that the lessons are on one page, the activities, uh, and that they have consistent parts. They have an objective to read parts of real words that contain previously taught vowel sounds. And then the summary of what we're going to do, and then what the students have uh, to sound out. And you can almost guess, contain, admit, abstract, they don't have to do that, but we just know that these come from real words that they're later going to read. Now notice there's an asterisk here and we're gonna ask them, what's the name? We're gonna cue that in this case, it's the name. And so they're gonna say, Tay, they're gonna say, try, they're gonna say, day. Okay, are you ready to teach it with me? Let's use that perky pace, but do pause, okay? Everybody begin. Find activity D. Pause. Continue. You're going to read parts of real words. Most of these word parts are not real words by themselves, but practicing them will help you read long words later. Continue. Line one. Read the first word part to yourselves. Put your thumb up when you can say the part and the teacher monitors. So we have the students cue the teacher when they've had enough thinking time. Uh, and so uh, this is simply to uh, be certain that we give them time to think about it. They cue us. They don't put it in the air. They put it right here so that you can monitor it and know you can go forward. Okay, so let's go back here and try two again. Line one. Read the first word part to yourselves. Put your thumb up when you can say the part. And then you're going to ask what part, everyone, and they're going to say, tain. Now let's look at the correction. If you hear some student make an error, maybe they say tin. You are going to say the word is tan, tain, or excuse me, uh, the word part is tain. Uh, let's sound it out. Tain. What part? Tain. Uh, so you are going to say it and have them repeat it. And then we go back and do the item again. Okay, would you move down here uh, to number three and continue? Next word part. Thumb up when you are ready. And what part? Yes, mint. Next word part. Now notice we fade out the directions to make it more efficient. Uh, so they already know they're supposed to put up their thumb as soon as they know it. And you say what part? Uh, and they say, say it again, strat. Uh, and so these are not real words, but are nonsense. Uh, are not nonsense words either, they're parts of real words. And let's go down here. Uh, so you're gonna continue asking uh, what part. And if you get done, then you might have the students uh, realign to the group. So I could call on Sarah to read a line. I could call on Walt to read a line. I could call on Maria to read a line. If I have a small group, Another possibility to give them more practice would say, uh, once you are the first reader, you're going to read these words to your partner. Uh, if you hear a partner make a mistake, just say stop, have them, you say the answer and have them repeat it. Then two is your turn to read it to your partner. Uh, if you hear a mistake, stop, 
uh, and say uh, that part is try, what part, and read on. And then you would monitor them as they said answers to their partners. So we often use partners for additional practice, but they have to be taught how to give feedback, uh, how to say stop, that is day, what is it? Day. Okay, so uh, we have taught them the sounds and taught them conversions. First try the sound, then try the name. Uh, we have practiced it uh, in uh, syllables, but they need one more skill in that they have to be able to locate the vowel graphemes within words because every word part has a vowel. And so I use this to help me break the word into decodable chunks. So they have to be able to recognize those vowel sounds. Uh, and so, you know, here, underline this is a vowel. This is letters that represent a vowel. This word has two parts. Uh, these letters that they've been taught you are represents a vowel. Uh, and OI represents a vowel. So there are two word parts. So they are going to use this skill to put it into decodable chunks. Well, let's look at this. And so again, the objective, the summary of what we're doing and what the students are looking at. <gasps> but look at, look at, look at, there is a icon. If there is an icon, that means we have to have a display. And this is the display. And we're going to use this throughout the lesson. So when we come to this section, we're gonna put this up on the screen. Uh, and so you'll see exactly how we're going to use this. Okay, so I want you to read through this to get to by yourself, and then we'll teach it together. And so uh, think about the display as you go. Okay, so I just had you read that to get the flow. Uh, and let's just talk about it and teach a little bit and talk about it. Uh, so we have this up on the screen. Uh, and right away, it tells us that we need to cover all the lines on the display except line one. Okay, and so we have covered up all except line one. Now, uh, if I am putting this up on something like a smart board. It has the ability for me to cover up lines two through five. So they only look at number one. So I can just put up uh, the part that blacks it out. Uh, if I am putting it on my iPad app, it has the possibility of making it only one line. If I am putting it up uh, on the screen on a mounted whiteboard, then I have more of a challenge. And I will tell you, just don't be terribly concerned 
but when it says for the students to do their work on their own, you're going to white it out so that it does not show on the screen. So that's one way. Yes, they'll see it initially while you talk about the first line, but when they go to work, then white it out. Uh, and if it's on a clipboard, you can have a piece of, uh, or excuse me, a dock camera, you can have a piece of paper uh, that you move down uh, over the paper that is being projected so they only see the first line. And if you have a clipboard, uh, you can have a piece of paper that covers it up so they only see the first. The major reason is you don't want to see when you say underline the vowel uh, sounds, you don't want them to have this on the screen because they won't have to think. So this is just to make it so we can give them feedback. So since I've seen this taught many times with a challenge, I just want to go over it, be certain we're right on for this. Okay, can you go down here and teach it with me uh, and go. Turn to page four, find activity E. Listen, each part of a word has one vowel sound. What does each word part have? one vowel sound. Finding the vowels in the word helps us read the word. Okay, this is a big idea about teaching multisyllabic words. Every part has one vowel sound. Watch me find the vowels in these words. Okay, so we have covered this up except line one. Uh, and uh, we say, looking at the word, uh, we, where it's underlined, what sound? A, yes, A. What sound? A, actually, forgive me. What sound? A, yes, A. What sound? A. How many vowel sounds? Two. So how many word parts? Two. Watch again. So you're tracing under the AI while you ask, what word, what sound? A, and how many vowel sounds? One. So how many word parts? One. Watch one more. Trace under the lines. And what sound? A. And what sound? A. How many vowel sounds? Two. So how many word parts? Two. Okay, so it's all scaffold for you because you're asking them, um, uh, what sound, a, eh? what sound, a, eh? so how many word parts, two, what sound, a, eh? how many vowels, one, so how many word parts, one, so we added the scaffolding here, uh, so that this could be done with ease, now we cover all of this up, and we say, uh, please go over here, and see my cursor. Now you underline the vowel sounds in the words in line one. And on their paper, then they underline it. Now underline the vowels in rest of the words. Look up when you are done. And then we are going to use the display and have the students check out their underlining. And then we are going to read the words. Now, when we initially re research rewards, uh, we had one condition that taught them a strategy that was simply called loop, 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 where they had loops under it. And the teacher said, what part, what part, what word, uh, what part, uh, what part, what part, what word. And that's basically what we're going to do here. They've underlined it, they have checked it to be certain their underlines are the same. And then the teacher is going to lead them using loop, loop, loop. What part main, what part tain? You know, even little tiny details we attended to. For example, should we have a slash mark to show the parts? Well, when you have a slash mark, it looks more like segmenting than blending. Uh, well, should we have space between the parts? No, because then it won't generalize to reading real words. So instead we use loops under it. What part, what part, what word? And that was much more effective.
So you see the details do matter for all students, but particularly for struggling students. Well, I just wanted to show you that uh, this continues throughout the first 15 lessons uh, and uh, it changes with the sounds. Now I have to say, part of the challenge of writing the program is finding words that had the sounds in it. Yes. Uh, and so it just continues, but the same basic idea, they are going to underline the vowels and you're gonna guide them in reading what part, what part, what part, what word, what part, what part, what word. And they get more and more difficult. Uh, and so what part, at, what part, di, what part, to, attitude, make it a real word, attitude. Well, let us take a short stretch, all right? Uh, and so stretch your body, five minutes, be back in your seat for the next segment. Want to keep those bodies moving, take a quick break. I'll see you in five. So we have looked at the activities that teach the letter sounds, that teach the blending of the letters in the word, uh, in the syllables. Uh, and we have teach, taught them how to underline the vowel sounds. And then with our guidance, what part, what part, what part, uh, say it. But here's what I mentioned before. There is no strategy. There's no strategy in English that's going to end up with perfect pronunciation every time. All we can hope for and all we are trying to do is get a close approximation to the pronunciation so that students could use their oral, oral language to correct the air. Uh, and so our goal is to get them close and then they have to correct it and make it match their oral, oral language. Now, of course, if they've never heard the word or they are students learning an additional language, then what you might have to do and would have to do is pronounce the word for them after they're close so that they can correct the pronunciation. And I used this example earlier, the child who said hotel uh, and so then the teacher had to say, we say a uh, hotel uh, and so that they could correct it to the correct pronunciation. But like all other embedded pre-skills, we should not just assume that students know this, we should teach it. So we have another oral activity, nothing in the book, uh, instead in the student book, but rather it's an oral activity of correcting uh, the close approximations using context. So we have the same organization uh, and let's teach this one together so we can all be alert and go. Listen, sometimes when we read, okay, let me do it again. So now you're with me. So saying it out loud, listen, sometimes when we read a long word, the word doesn't sound right. We have to change the pronunciation of the word so it makes sense in the sentences. Let's see if you can change these words to make sense in sentences. My turn to teach it. Listen carefully. I read the word husband. Change the word to make sense in this sentence. Have you met Mrs. Smith's husband? What should the word be? Everyone, husband. So we are intentionally mispronouncing the word. Instead of husband, we are saying husband, and we switched and we're going to emphasize this uh, syllable. And they're going to make it a real word. This is exactly what you need to do in reading. You've sounded out the word, you've read all the word parts, but it doesn't sound right and you make it a real word. Okay, my turn again. Uh, and the word is timid, timid. The quiet boy was very timid. What's the real word? Timid, yes, timid. 
And listen again. Ha, captain, captain. The captain steered the boat to the dock. And what should the word be? Captain. So the kids like this very much. It's a, a sort of a game with them, but it's a really important skill. Make it a real word, make it a real word, make it a real word. Well, we have looked at all of the activities around strengthening their use of vowels as a part of reading multisyllabic words. But the next part is peel off the prefix, peel off the suffix. 80% of the words have a prefix or suffix. One of the best skills you could have for sounding out a long word is knowing the prefixes and suffixes. Now you need a new piece of paper near you. Uh, and I would like you to write down the word prefix. So this lists the prefixes that we're going to introduce. We only teach high frequency prefixes, uh, ones that are gonna occur in many words. Uh, and this shows which lesson they are introduced in. Now, if they have an asterisk, that means that the meaning of the prefix is very useful to students in figuring unknown words. Some affixes over time have simply been embedded uh, in words and no longer carry with them specific meanings. Thus, they're not as useful to figure out words. But the ones that are useful, we teach. For example, uh, dis means not. It's helpful. Miss means wrong. Uh, and in means not. And im means not. And re means again. Pre means before. And un means not. So we are selective, teaching them the meanings of those prefixes that are very useful to help you in words. Uh, and so, but here is the challenge. And we're going to first see it with prefixes, that some prefixes are not pronounced like you'd expect, given the letters that are present. So we have to have like a little alert sign for ourselves to be certain that we teach kids the correct pronunciation of the prefixes. Okay, so we are going to look at these and we have cue words here for teachers as well as students. And the word is disagree and the prefix is, yes, dis. Misprint, prefix, miss. Abnormal, prefix, ab. Admit, prefix, add. Incomplete, prefix, in. Impossible, prefix, im. Come, pair, prefix, come. Now it looks like it's calm, but the most common pronunciation in words is come. Now, why did I have the list there? I want you to make a list of ones that you're gonna to have to be careful on because they're not pronounced like you'd expect. Okay, so I've written down the first one. And continue, con. Again, it's not pronounced continue, it's continue. So would you add that to your list of, word, of prefixes that are not pronounced like you'd expect? K, belong, prefix B. Deforest. Prefix D. Reprint. Prefix re. Repay. Prefix pre. Proclaim. Prefix pro. Permit. Prefix per. Unfair. Prefix un. Afraid. Prefix uh, oh, darn. No wonder they have trouble with the short sound of the letter A. When it's a prefix, 
it's pronounced as in afraid. The sound uh, darn. And export prefix X. In list prefix N. Excellent job. But there are three that we would have to be certain that we uh, told them. These are not pronounced like you'd expect. And so it is not come, but come. Uh, and so we would not con, uh, but uh, so we'd have to go over the pronunciation of those so that they would get them right. Okay, now on your paper, write suffix. And we're going to do the same thing. We're going to look at, is it pronounced like you'd expect or not? Now, first of all, we found that the students uh, already knew S. Uh, and so we did not have uh, to have special instruction on that. They got it. And ING, even though it's irregular, all the students knew ING. So they were able to read running. ED, the problem there is that there is three pronunciations. It could be ad, it could be d, or it could be t. Uh, and so we had to be certain that we pronounce those words, particularly for English language learners, because they tend to ed everything, because it looks like ed, uh, and they needed to know what its pronunciation was on specific words. Okay, so now let's look at some of the other parts of a word. So we have operate, and the part is eight. Use less, and we have the part, the suffix that is less. Kindness, kindness, and we have the suffix ness. And class ick, and the suffix is ick. Van ish, and the pronunciation is ish. It's all going well up to now. Artist, ist, and the suffix is ist. And big est, and the suffix is est. Realism, and the suffix is ism. Okay, we're sort of okay up to now. All of the pronunciations of these are very close to what we'd expect given the letters that are there. But it's so disappointing, the number of suffixes that are not pronounced like you'd expect. So again, have your pencil ready to add. And if we said careful, and the suffix is full. Personal, personal, all. And the suffix is all. It looks like al. Per, and if you said person al, uh, not as close as person all. So I'm going to add that to my list. And uh, then we have uh, farm er, er, good. Inventor, er. So in English, we don't say inventor, we say inventor. So uh, let's add that to our list of ones that we need to be careful about. And courage, courage, not courage, courage. Oh, darn. So add that one. This is the sad story of suffixes. Tack all. Now, uh, so the suffix is all, not Lee, but all. Darn. Ak shun, shun. Not tie on, shun. So one day I made that statement. It was a seventh grade class, and this boy raised his hand and said, Tie on. Is that like you tie one on? So, elementary people, be blessed that you're not teaching middle school though they did amaze me. So this one is not shun or not tie on, but shun. So I'm gonna add that to my list. Similarly, uh, this is extension, shun, not scion, but shun. Oh, 
darn. Okay, and uh, next word, attentive, tiv. It looks like it should be tive, attentive, but it's tiv. And these occur so often in words that we do want to use the pronunciation as they appear in words. Expensive is sieve, not sive. Oh, darn. Oh, we got kind of a growing list here of suffixes. And what word? Thirst e. And the suffix is e. Now, that is what you expect in that. In English, when you have a multisyllabic word and e at the end, it has a sound e. If you have a single syllable word like cry, the Y at the end has a sound I. So this is regular, but the students may not know it. And next word is safely, and this is Lee. So it's pronounced like you'd expect. Uh, next word, missionary, airy. Except if you saw just this, you'd think it was Ari, but it's airy. Oh, got to add that one. I've got to be careful. And odd a T. A T is how you would expect to pronounce it. Informant. It's unt, not ant. And so I say, ah, oh, I've got to be careful on that one. And consistent or consistent. We mostly say consistent, unt. Oh no. And that's why we have these keywords for you. Argument, meant. So we're close on that one. And disturb, disturb ants. But we say disturbance, ants. We don't say ants, ants. Okay, so we're gonna have to be careful there. Oh my goodness. And occurrence, ants. But if we look at it, it looks like ants. So I'm gonna be careful there too. Oh, and here's a big one, picture. And suffix is chur, but it looks like tour, but it's chur. So I'm adding that to my list. Uh, and partial, and the suffix is show, darn. And this is one that many teachers have mispronounced. So you gotta be careful. Agree a bull. Not agree able, but a bull, a bull. So you can see why we give you Q words even for the teacher. Um, reverse a bull, a bull. And it is not eyeball or ibull. And the last one, memorize eyes. Thank goodness we end up on a positive note. So this is just to remind you that many suffixes are not pronounced like you'd expect. So you must pronounce them correctly and use the key words so that you can get down the pronunciation. But the biggest ones to watch uh, is it's not able but a bull. It is not scion, but shun. It is not tithe, but tiv. Those are particular ones. Oh, and I skipped one. Nervous. This looks like ouse, but it's us. Uh-oh, better add that to my list. So those are very high frequency. Uh, so how do we teach it? Directly. <laughs> we teach them very directly. Uh, and we teach them intentionally because as we've reinforced, 80% of multisyllabic words have one or more affects. So we teach the pronunciation of high frequency prefixes and high frequency suffixes. And we're careful when it has a pronunciation is, that is not what you'd expect. Uh, we're not gonna say tie on, but shun. We're not gonna say al, but ol. We're not gonna say able, but a bull. And how are we gonna teach it? So teaching it with me and go. Find activity G. You're going to learn about word parts we call prefixes. 
Prefixes always come at the beginning of words. Do prefixes come at the beginning or at the end of words? The beginning. Now, if you just stop and analyze this, this routine, this rhythm is throughout the whole program. You teach some information and then you ask a question to verify it. You teach a pronunciation and then you ask a question to verify. So you're going to see that throughout uh, that we teach and then we ask, or we tell, then we ask, then we tell, then we ask. We don't ask first uh, because they're learning it. So we tell them the information and then ask them. Okay, are you with me? Good, and go. Point to the first column in the box. So they're pointing here. Continue. The first word is disagree. What word? Disagree. Point to the circled prefix. The prefix is dis. Say it. Dis. Now here, we introduce it in a word. That's so the students can hear it within the context, but it's also because it gives you a prompt for the correct pronunciation. So we introduce it in a word and then we isolate it. And so we go through the words here. Point, point to the next word. The word is misprint. What word? Misprint. Point to the circled prefix. The prefix is miss. Say it, miss. And we continue with abnormal and admit. But then we want them to recognize it without the support of the word. So we go up here and look down at number five, find the second column. Now, sometimes you have to say to yourself, is there something here the students might not know? I'm not going to commit a suicide. I'm not going to assume it. I'm going to teach it like the word column. So when you read through this before you teach it, you say, oh, maybe I te better teach them when I go down like this. It is a column and like this is a column. And then sometimes we use a row and that goes across. Columns down, columns down, rows across. So assume nothing, teach everything. Okay, back to five. Find the second column. Read the prefixes. What prefix? This. Next. Yes, miss. Next. Yes, ab. Next, add. Continue. The parts of words you have learned come at the beginning of words. What are they called? Yes, prefixes. Continue. In the next activity, you're going to circle these prefixes. So you would know that we will continue to teach prefixes and suffixes in all the first 15 lessons, and we will have cumulative review uh, so that every day they're going to have more that they are re renew reteaching and being able to review so that they will have automaticity. So now we're going to peel off the prefixes, peel off the suffixes by identifying the prefixes, later the suffixes, circling them, and then reading words with the teacher's help. What part, what part, what part? So let's look at the lesson for this. So again, don't you just love uh, the way that this is organized because teachers love structure, students benefit from structure, uh, and we wanted to make this so teacher friendly. Yes, uh, first, as you're starting to study the program, you wanna read the lessons beforehand. And there's certain lessons that you always want to read because they change on a daily basis. Uh, but the fact that it has a pattern means that uh, over time, you are going to get that pattern down. You're even going to get the wording down so that you can end up with a much perkier pace. It'll move along more smoothly. So that's why we keep the wording the same for the activities over time. Well, we have the uh, objective, identify and circle prefixes in long words.
Then with the teacher's support, sound out the words using the prefixes. And how are we going to go about it? What the teach students are looking at, look at how much practice they get uh, in locating, identifying, in this case, prefixes, and then under teacher guidance, reading the parts together. And then we look at the lesson, we say, oh, there's that icon. Thank goodness I already downloaded the displays. This is the third displayed in lesson one that we're using. So I'm all set to go. Here is the display. And uh, let's read this together and go. Look at page five. Pause. Find activity H. Do prefixes come at the beginning or at the end of words? Everyone, the beginning. So look at the beginning of these words and circle the prefixes uh, you just learned in activity G. Be careful, not every word has a prefix. Some words have no prefixes and some have one. Look up when you are done. So let's just talk about this. So here, this word has a prefix they've learned, miss. And this word does not have a prefix, dash. This word has a prefix ab that they've learned, uh, but this word doesn't have a prefix. Why is this so important in terms of design? Well, if every word had a prefix, the students would conclude that every multisyllabic word has a prefix. And then they would start making up prefixes just to be circling something. Like they would look at this word and say, well, maybe it's M-I, maybe it's M-I-N. Uh, nope, there's no prefix there. Uh, they look at this word, maybe it is A-I, no prefix. So they, if the students have discernment necessary, they have to decide if there's a prefix or not, then we need examples, word with prefixes, and non-examples, words without prefixes. This is an error we've often made in teaching, having all of the items have uh, the item, but then the students don't learn how to make a discernment when to apply it and when not to apply it. So we need examples and non-examples, examples and non-examples. So the students are on their paper, they are circling the prefixes. And then uh, we say to them, now check to see if you circled all the prefixes, fix up any mistakes. It says pause and monitor. So the teacher needs to be monitoring, looking at their page to be certain that they have been careful in circling the prefixes. They don't need to add the loops. We're gonna use the loops as teachers. Uh, and so you are moving around the room to be certain that they are self-correcting carefully. You know, there is great power in self-corrections. Uh, so I'm not calling in the papers and correcting them. I'm having them correct them against the sample. So they have to examine it and learn as they are going. Well, uh, then we guide them in reading of the words. You're already getting down the routines here. Uh, so looking over here, with each word, use the following procedure. Trace under the loops, loop, 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 indicating word parts while you ask what part, what part, what word. What part, what part, what word. So that is exactly how we are going to do this. Uh, what part, what part, what word. What word? What part? What part? What word? Now I'm often asked, could I give the definition of these words? Well, if you gave a definition for each of these words, we're not going to finish up this program this year. But they're, you're certainly welcome when they say, what does abstract uh, mean? and you can give them a short definition, what we call fast mapping, a short definition. So when something isn't very clear, uh, like I make a letter B and it's very clear, but maybe I make another B and it's not so clear, we could say it is 
abstract. So you can give a little explanation of some words. Welcome to do that. A fast definition and move on. Now, let's look here. One of the things that we do is we work on fluency, on being more automatic, even before we start practicing it with uh, passages. And so this is an activity they're going to do with their partners. You need assigned partners uh, and assign them, give them a number one and two, because sometimes you're going to say ones do it first, then twos, sometimes twos, then ones. So if you want to use some other words, like one teacher used north and south, fine, but the partners are designated already and given a label, one and two, north and south. And you say, notice you have to have a stopwatch here or your phone with a stopwatch and read it. Get ready for a 10 second rapid read. Partner one, you'll be first reader. Read as many words as you can until I say stop. Partner two, count the words as your partner reads, begin. And so uh, the partner uh, reads for 10 seconds and you say stop. Partner two, hold up your fingers and show me how many words your partner read. Uh, and you look around the room, 10, you know, two, gives you feedback on how automatic they are. Now, partner two, your turn to read. And they read for 10 minutes while their partner counts the words. So these little fluency, because we can build fluency at the word level, even before we work on it at the passage level. So fluency, uh, automaticity is already something we're working on. And now we also teach the meanings of words. And you'll remember that not all of the words had an asterisk because we actually took lists of words with prefixes or suffixes and we looked at in which case is it really helpful to know that prefix or suffix in terms of not just decoding the word, but being able to know the meaning of it and figure the meaning out. So we were very selective, only very high frequency prefix and suffixes where the meaning is going to assist them Do we teach it. Uh, so, for example, um, these students and have a word, forgive me there, I've got a new advancer and it's very sensitive, too sensitive for me. So, uh, these students have a word such as disloyal, and they know that this means not, so it means not loyal. So the whole purpose of this is, yes, to teach them the meaning of high frequency prefix and suffixes, but also to give them the big idea that when you add a prefix to a root or a suffix to a root, it systematically alters the meaning of the word. So that big idea, as well as the specific information on the meanings of prefix and suffixes. Now you can see because of all the lessons, the activities we've done up to this point, that if you did them many, many times, you'd get down the flowing of the words. In fact, by lesson 15, uh, you could look up from this script uh, and teach it very well, but not on this one. This one is so specific every time that you need to read it beforehand uh, and use the script, particularly in the lesson. So just make a note on this one, because the wording changes quite significantly from lesson to lesson, you need to use the script here. So uh, it is written down here. Here's the student book. They're going to learn miss, mean wrongly or wrong or not and this meaning not or opposite of. Okay, so I'm gonna teach a little bit of it. You keep your eye on this. Find activity I. Look at the first prefix. Miss means wrongly, wrong, or not. 
So if you heard that Tyler had miscalculated, you could guess that Tyler had done something wrong. Look at the second prefix, dis. Dis means not or opposite of. So if someone said that Emma was disorganized, you could guess that Emma was not organized or the opposite of organized. Learning the meaning of prefixes sometimes helps you figure out the meaning of the word. Teacher talk. Remember I talked about uh, pre-corrections? Well, I want students to know that knowing these parts often can be helpful, but not always. Often can be helpful, but not always. Because some children got really frustrated when they knew what the prefix or the suffix meant, but they still couldn't figure out the word. So it's sometimes helpful, it's not always helpful. If you expect it, pre-correct it. So let's learn the meanings of some words that have prefixes miss and dis. So now they're looking here in the book and look at A, read the explanation with me. Now, every time there's something to read, we have the students either read it to themselves or read it together or read it to a partner. We don't read everything to them. Why? Well, if you're going to become a better reader, you got to read and read and read some more and read and read and read some more. One of the errors that we see being made uh, in elementary and middle school classes is the teacher doing all the reading. Uh, and if we do all the reading, we're getting very good, but that is not our mission. It is to get them very good. So here you are going to uh, read this together, but here's something important is utilize a speaking speed, like the speed of your speech. I tend to go too fast. And so I've had to really watch this when I'm teaching any program. Okay, back to two again, look at A and continue. Read the explanation with me. Someone who does not fit with rest of the group, a person whose looks, ideas, or behavior are quite different from a certain group. Find the word that means someone who does not fit uh, with the rest of the group in line one of activity H. So you have to go back to the previous lesson or the previous activity and write it on the line. So you monitor, you walk around, look around, talk around quietly. And then you ask them a question and go, what word means someone who does not fit? And their answer is misfit. So if everyone showed up at a party wearing costumes and someone showed up not wearing one, that person would be called a misfit. Then watch carefully. That's why we have to use a script because it varies from lesson to lesson. In what other situations might a person feel like a misfit? Partner two, tell your partner what might someone feel, what might make someone feel like a misfit. Begin by saying, a person might feel like a misfit if he or she. So here's something that I want you to pick up on is that in this lesson, the students are going to use misfit in a sentence, but we want them to use the word misfit. So we give them a sentence starter. Start by saying a person might feel like a misfit if he or she and then they're going to add to that. If I don't give them a sentence starter, they might say something like, well, maybe if you didn't know the language people spoke, or maybe uh, if you uh, were uh, shorts in the middle of winter. Now, those are two examples where someone might feel like a misfit. Unfortunately, the child did not say misfit. 
So if you want them to use academic language, give them sentence starters in all of your teaching. And there's another reason for it. Would we not like children to practice speaking in sentences so they might be better able to write sentences? So uh, here, begin by saying a person might feel like a misfit if he uh, wore shorts in the middle of winter. Not only did they use the word misfit, but they had a complete sentence, two benefits of sentence starters. So their uh, fine uh, look at B, read the explanation with me, to do the opposite of claim, to give up a claim. Find the word in line three of activity H and write it. So you're monitoring as they find the word and you ask what word means to do the opposite of claim. Disclaim. So if you give up your claim or uh, to someone you owe you, you disclaim it. So uh, looking at that again, you're going to uh, have them write the word down. So again, I'll just tell you this one you need to read carefully. Uh, and excuse me, sometimes I made errors because the print is not as big as I need. So uh, read uh, the lesson beforehand and use the script when you teach it. But oh, what a value this is. This is exactly what we should be teaching in fourth and fifth and sixth grade classes is not only the pronunciation of prefix suffixes, not only the fact that most multisyllabic words have a prefix and suffix that we could peel off from the word, making it easier to break into decodable parts, not only the meaning of them, but also uh, the pronunciation of them, but also the meaning of prefix and suffixes. K, well, spelling. You need a piece of paper. Can you get a piece of paper out? So like everything else, we use a routine and we use uh, routines that have been validated in other studies. And then we validate it within the program. So here you're going to dictate a word and then the students are going to say orally the parts in the word as they put up one finger for each part. Then they're going to write the word. Then they're gonna compare their word spelling to the correct spelling of the word. And if they miss it, they're gonna cross it out and rewrite it. They're not gonna fix it up uh, because this is a sequential skill. They're going to rewrite the word. Uh, and so this is a consistent routine for dictation that you could use within this program and outside of the program. So you are my students. So you need pen and pencil in hand. And uh, so my turn. So the students don't have the words on their paper. Uh, it shows here with the answers, it's blank. Find page six. Find activity J. At the end of each lesson, you will spell four words from the lesson. Please cover up the rest of the page because there might be some other words on the page. We don't want them to copy. The first word is admit. You're my students. The first word is admit. What word, everyone? Admit. Put your fist in the air. Put up one finger for each part and say the parts in admit with me. First part, add, next part, mit. Say the word, the part slowly to yourself as you write the word. So the students are going admit. So we teach them in spelling, you take the word, segment it into oral syllables and write down each syllable. And then we are going to show the word. 
And so we would show the word and tell them uh, and check admit. If you misspelled it, cross it out and write it correctly. What are you supposed to generalize from that? Well, first, all feedback in spelling needs to be visual. A little law of teaching, all feedback in spelling, the feedback should be visual. Some teachers tried to correct it by orally spelling it. Admit is spelled A-D-M-I-T. But when you hear that, you do not get a visual picture of the word. But if the teacher says, look at it, you get a visual feedback on the word. I would like you to do that in many other situations. For example, you're moving around the room and uh, you stop the child and they say, how do you spell? And you say, they say the word. Don't spell it out loud. Take with you a pencil and on their paper, write down the word so they see the whole word. Visual feedback for spelling. K, now the second part was, if you misspelled it, cross it out and write it. Now let's say that I had this on my paper. Uh, admit versus admit. And some kids just want to cross out the T and add a D. But spelling is a sequential skill. Every letter leads to the next letter. Every sound that is represented by that letter moves to the next sound and the next sound. So the students need to practice the whole word. So they have to cross it out and rewrite it. Now, there's another reason why we did it that way, and that is the concept of response cost. If you can't figure, just fix it up, but you have to cross out the whole word and write it again, might you be more careful? Yes, response cost uh, helps kids be more careful. For example, if we're reading along and the students make a error, and we stop them and we say the word and they repeat it. And then we say, go back and reread the sentence. It costs them something, so they're gonna wanna be more careful. So every day in the program, they are, at least every lesson, they are dictated for words. Okay, so what else do we want to teach them? Those are the words. Uh, and so when we taught those words, then we plucked out of all the words we taught, words that are particularly high frequency that they might utilize in the future uh, and to practice uh, spelling words and using a strategy of saying the word by parts and writing down each part. Now, the strategy we use for teaching uh, the meaning of the words. We already previewed, but let's look at it again. Step number one, introduce the word, particularly careful that they know the pronunciation of the word. Because if you cannot pronounce it, you can't attach meaning to it, store it cognitively and retrieve it. Number two, provide a student-friendly explanation. So a student-friendly explanation uh, would be one that would be easy to understand. And so that's exactly what we use throughout the rewards program. Number three, illustrate the words meaning with examples. Uh, so we need a, not just a definition, but the word in context so we have a better idea of how it fits into this world. Number four, check for understanding. We'll ask questions to check their understanding. Now, because uh, this differs from lesson, 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 this is another case where you really have to read this 
part of the lesson beforehand so you can read it and teach it with fluency. All right, so I'm going to put this up on the screen and I want you to read the instructional steps to yourself to get an idea of the flow before we teach it together and begin. Okay, I think you read it carefully. So you could see because of us writing in examples for you, so you don't have to think them up at the moment, uh, you need to preview the lesson and you really need to use the script uh, with it. So let us just teach a little bit of it to get the rhythm once again. And going back up here, the students are looking at these two words and their definitions. And Continue, everyone. Find activity K. You're going to learn two vocabulary words. Look at line one. Read the word to yourself. Oh, they've already sounded out this word before, so we do not want to tell them the word. We want them to use their skills. What word? Distract. So it's this little way all through the program where is that gradual release of responsibility. They have been, it's been modeled, they have practiced it, they've practiced it with the teacher, and now it turns over to them. Number two, continue. Read the explanation with me. If someone or something distracts you, they take your attention away from what you are doing. Continue. If you're reading a book and loud music is playing, the music might distract you. If you're taking a math test and a friend starts talking to you, the friend might distract you. Think, what are some things that might distract you if you were working on a project at home? So you give the students some preparation, some think time, and you say, partner one, tell your partner what would distract you if you were working on a project at home? Begin by saying, or oh, the sentence starter, some things that would distract you, would distract me include. And so, uh, then the students are sharing it with their partner. I might say some things that would distract me include the garbage truck that's going by, uh, the neighbors that are talking. Uh, might uh, Let's see what else might distract me. Large, loud music. Uh, what might distract me? My assistant coming into my office. Yes. So again, tell yourself the two reasons that we use sentence starters. We do it so that they will use the academic word because they might simply answer the question, well, the garbage truck, uh, the loud music, neighbors talking. And unfortunately, they never said distract. If I want them to learn distract, I want them to say distract, distract, distract. But also I want them to have complete sentences. So here we're teaching two words. 
with an academic vocabulary as in our original research. But we found that many teachers would love to have PowerPoints to teach this so that they have visuals to go with it. So I'm just gonna go on the lesson and show you the visuals. Ooh, cool PowerPoints, all set up for you to teach the uh, two words. Ooh, okay. So this saves you a lot of time uh, and it would be very useful to the students. So you actually have in your teacher's manual, uh, two lessons for the same vocabulary words. And one of them we already looked at. And now we have one that is the illustrated vocabulary displays. We found that almost all teachers, uh, when they had a choice of doing the one that utilizes the student book only, or one that had visual vocabulary displays, they picked that one. But then we had a lot of teachers who were teaching students with low vocabulary or were English language learners learning an additional language. And they actually benefited by us teaching both on different days so that there was much more practice of the words for retention sake in terms of vocabulary. So you get to pick, uh, just teach one, probably the illustrated vocabulary display teach both, teach the illustrated one first, and then at a later date, go back and teach uh, the uh, one that uh, is in the student book. All right, now we wrote out the whole script. Notice icon, well, yes, you're gonna need displays uh, for those visual academic vocabulary slides. So, uh, and quite a few slides. So you've got to have those um, displays. Now you could follow along and use the script, which is useful to read beforehand. Uh, so let me just give you an idea. Find activity K. You're going to learn two vocabulary words. Look up here. And you show the display. Uh, read the word to yourself. Oh, now the responsibility is there. What word? distract, what part of speech, verb, read the explanation with me. If someone or something distracts you, they take your attention away from what you're doing. So if someone or something takes your attention away from what you are doing, it, yes, distracts you. A synonym is a word or phrase with the same or similar meaning. What word is a synonym for distract? Yes, disturb. Now, okay, so you could use the script, but we found that even as I taught this, I found it difficult to use the script and keep their attention on the display. So I'll tell you, if you read through the script first, but when you go to teach it, you could use the display uh, to guide your teaching. So let's see what that would look like. That's the, okay. So you're gonna be my students. So be ready to shout out those answers. Okay, looking up here, here's our vocabulary words that we are learning and sound out this word to yourself. Put your thumb up when you know it. Okay, everybody, what word? Distract, yes. What part of speech is it? Yes, a verb, an action word. Uh, let's read the explanation together. And everyone, if someone or something distracts you, they take your attention away from what you, what you are doing. They take your attention away from what you are doing. And a synonym, uh, which it means the same or similar, and read that with me, disturb. So disturb uh, is a synonym with very similar meaning to what? Distract, excellent. Teacher talk. So here I am letting the slide guide my instruction 
because I pre-rate it. I know what it's meant to look like and sound like, but I'm using this. So let's look at some examples of distract. So here uh, we have two riders in a race on horses. Very exciting. And read it with me, everyone. A loud noise could distract the horses. It could take their attention away from the race. And read the next one with me. A moving flag could distract the horses. So they often have flags to start and stop the race. And that might be distracting. Continue. The horses might even distract each other. Look how close they are together. So they could take this horse, could take this horse's attention away from the race, could distract them. And so what might distract one of the riders? So here we have the riders. What might distract the riders? Think for a moment. They're in a race. What might distract them? Okay, one, you're going to say an answer to your partner, uh, and you're going to start by saying, everybody read it with me, one thing that might distract one of the riders is teacher talk. Really useful in this case because the sentence starter is on the screen. So if they forget it, they can check there. So ones might say, one thing that might distract one of the riders is a loud noise. Now twos, using the sentence starter, tell your partner what might distract one of the riders. And the student says, one thing that might distract one of the riders is a rabbit that runs across the course. That might distract them. So you see, you could, if you're familiar with the script, you could teach it utilizing the PowerPoint. Now, for many of the words, we introduce the word family that the word is in. And this is just a reminder that this is so useful in our classrooms because if the word has related words and we go over those words, we learn not just one word uh, in this case, uh, but we learn three words. Uh, so be my students. Here are three words that are all related to the first word. And the word is distract, which is a verb. Uh, and this word is, everyone, distracting, which is an adjective. Next word is distraction, which is a noun. Let's read those again. First word, yes, distract. Next word. Yes, distracting. Next word. Yes, distraction. Beautiful. Okay, and so we introduce uh, the words in the word family. And everybody, I'm going to read. When I stop, you're going to say the next word. When you study, hearing loud music may distract you. Listening to the lyrics, the words can be especially distracting, yes. You may want to remove this distraction by turning off the music so you can concentrate. So already students are not just reading long words, but reading long words within context. So I would highly recommend utilizing the uh, illustrated PowerPoints uh, and read the lessons beforehand so you're familiar with our examples, but then use the PowerPoints and follow the flow in the PowerPoint. Uh, and so they, we introduce the word and its pronunciation. We introduce the meaning uh, and then we illustrate it with some examples. Uh, and then we ask a question to check their understanding. 
Uh, so uh, the routine will be used across the two words that are embedded in every lesson uh, and even more words when we get to the passage reading where we prepare them by pre-teaching vocabulary. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there just to check in to see if we had any questions emerge before we finish this off. Yes, I do see one question and one I think just comment. The question is, I am curious if compound multisyllable words are taught differently, especially if either part contains prefixes or suffixes that end up in the middle of the compound word. Example, counterclockwise. The only true suffix is er, er but, it is, but it's in the middle of the word. Is there a strategy for first splitting the compound word apart so that students can find the suffix? I thought of this word because it was used as an example in the beginning part of Dr. Archer's presentation today. Well, how useful that you recognized it. But in that case, uh, they er can be a suffix, but basically this is a multi, this is a compound word. So uh, when we sound it out, because you don't necessarily know that it's a compound word before you say it, uh, the kids will go counterclockwise uh, and sound it out that way because prefixes come at the beginning of the word and suffixes come at the end. So they don't know it's a compound word. But I will tell you uh, this, uh, let's say that I have a compound word such as bird house, which doesn't have that challenge. And they read the first part bird and they read the next part house. Uh, but to learn the meaning of the word, uh, you uh, ask it the other way. Uh, so it is a house where they're for a bird. Uh, and so you go left to right to figure out the meaning of a compound word, bird house to figure out the pronunciation of it, but to figure out the meaning, you go left to right, it's a house for a bird. A mailman is a man who delivers the mail. A daydream is a dream you have during the day. Uh, and so uh, you go clockwise, but it's counterclockwise. But I will tell you, whoever asked you that question is like so good. They really, really, really looked carefully at this. I'm very impressed. Never thought about that myself, but you don't know it's a compound word when you go to sound it out. So you use your usual practice. You peel off the prefixes at the beginning of the word, peel off the suffixes at the end. And this is a rare occasion where it's a compound word with a prefix in the middle. In that case, you might break it down into counter and clockwise and then put it together for a longer word. But stars for you who asked that question. So, and remember, no strategy is absolutely perfect. It makes us break it down into parts. So we have a approximation to the, the uh, pronunciation and then we match it to oral oral language. Okay, do we have any other questions? Nope, no other questions. There was just a comment if you'd like me to read that. Otherwise, that was the only other is it, question. Is there a comment embedded in it? Go nope, ahead, it, was just, it was just a comment that said, I noticed that you have even rotated starting partners each lesson for activity K, for example, when you are wanting to use a script. That is helpful. Thank you. You know, everything, every little detail matters. And so we don't want to call on one always first. So we actually have rotated them. I call them one, then twos. The next time I call twos, then ones, and ones, and twos, and twos, and ones. Just those little details do make a difference. You can't imagine how many details in a program that has 840 words. All right. Well, how is progress monitored? Now, we all already had a pre and post test in terms of fluency uh, so that we know what kind of fluency they had in terms of rate, words read per minute at the beginning of the program, at the end, which we had significant gains in. 
But we also, during the program, when we move to passages, the students are going to uh, listen to their partner read the passage and they're going to graph the uh, words per minute. So throughout the program, there will be progress monitoring on fluency. And then we had the multisyllabic word reading program where they read for a minute multisyllabic words, which is given as a pretest and a post test. So once again, uh, that will show their progress over time. But we need more feedback. Now, every time I ask a question uh, and listen to their answers, uh, I am doing progress monitoring because if there is an error, I'm going to correct it. If it is correct, I'm going to acknowledge that so that I'm constantly using the feedback. And maybe they've made a number of errors on a line as we're reading it. Uh, then I'm going to say, let's go back and practice that line again. So I'm even adjusting my lesson as we go. So we have formal progress monitoring at the beginning and the end. We have minute to minute progress in monitoring as we teach it, but we need something to really hold the kids accountable. And so we have a system of progress monitoring. Uh, now, the progress monitoring looks like this. Uh, this is uh, for the first uh, lesson or the first unit, forgive me. Uh, and let's just look at the parts of it. So we're going to go to each child and have them read one line. So it says to the students, practice reading all the words in each line. The teacher will ask you to read one line and each point is worth five points with a total of 25. So uh, the students are going to practice. Then I'm going to come in and say, uh, Harriet read that line uh, and Jacob read this line. Um, and so forth. But the students need to do something while I'm going from student to student. Uh, and so they also have uh, this where they're going to go over the academic vocabulary. Ooh, there's the word admit that we taught. Uh, and uh, so, and distract. So they're going to read uh, and circle the letter. Uh, that best defines the word. So they're working on this while you're asking children to read a line. Uh, and uh, so what else do they have to do? Well, the next one is the one that students had uh, the most challenge with. That is the meanings of the prefix and suffixes that they've learned. So the items are the same from unit to unit from uh, check up to check up to check up. What part of the word restart means again? Re. So restart means to start again. What part of the word disclaim means opposite of? Dis. So disclaim means to do the opposite of. Okay. Do students need some extra practice on this? Yep. So maybe after you finish the unit lessons online, we have a special practice just of the meaning of prefixes and suffixes because they've only had it once, they might need more practice. So don't forget you have extra practice to do with them before this. And then uh, you are going to dictate words uh, and abstain, miscast, contrast. And each of these are going to be worth five points. And now there is a bonus activity here uh, that they can make words using these parts of the word. So they could make uh, repay, or uh, they could make a word such as imprint. And you're going to correct this with them. No taking home of these tests. You can correct it with them. And the directions for the checkout will tell you how to do that. But you see, 
in one study, they didn't do the checkups. They taught the lessons, but no checkups. And the next one, they had the uh, lessons taught and the checkups. And the students' gains went up with the checkups. Now, why would that happen? Well, it happened because, number one, oh, they're really expecting me to know this. They're going to hold me accountable. I am going to put on the graph the score that I got. I've got to be certain that it's a high score. So the students felt more accountable that they were going to be held accountable for what they've been taught. Number two, uh, the teachers also felt more accountable to be able to teach it to mastery as they taught the lessons so the students would do better on the checkups. So both groups benefited, the teacher and the students. But also it gave feedback to the teacher. They might say, you know, I taught the meanings of these words, but many of my students miss them. So I say to myself, I'm not going to go back and teach whole lessons again, but I might want to have more review uh, as we go forward of words that they've been taught. So the teacher utilizes the feedback to alter his or her instruction on future lessons. Uh, and uh, maybe I have students, when we realign to me personally, that they make more errors uh, they're not 100% accurate, so I say to myself, now when I teach the next lesson, it's obvious the students need more practice. So after we read a line, we're gonna, I'm going to say, let's go back and reread that line in the lessons. Let's go back and reread the line in the lessons so that the students are getting more assistance. You say to yourself, oh, uh, my students, missed a number of the spelling words. And so when I dictate the spelling words to them, I'm gonna be very careful in the future lessons to pronounce the syllables very carefully, have them say abstain. I am going to be certain that they're saying it to themselves as they write the word and that they're checking the word against my model carefully. So they're more likely to remember uh, how to spell it. So this is meant to give us information to inform our future teaching. We don't recommend you go back and reteach whole lessons. We found that that's kind of a downer uh, for students. Uh, it was better for us to do two things, pick out segments they missed and review that segment. And as you go forward, for parts that they uh, did poorly on, then teach that with more practice. Let's read that line again. Let's do that again. Well, boy, we have covered a whole bunch of information today. Uh, and um, we are going to direct you to get started. Uh, you are going to follow the steps that are outlined on the pages in the front matter 26 to 29. And it tells you step by step what you need to do for the first uh, lesson, what you need to reproduce, what you need to read through, uh, and so forth. So be certain to check that out uh, in your manual. Well, we're going to have some questions here. Uh, and my real hope now we have my neighbor's dog. Yes, everybody's alive in my neighborhood. Uh, that your students are going to be really rewarded from this lesson and these lessons. That they will see their gains. They will get better. They will see it and you will too. Now, uh, I really want you all to open up your cameras at this moment. Uh, so everybody who is on, cameras are open. Yay, thank you, Carrie, Melissa. And I want to uh, have you ask any questions for clarifications. Um, and so, uh, Sarah, I don't think we had any questions come in, but 
If anybody has a question, just open up your camera and ask the question. Anita, we did have one question in the chat box. All right, Sarah, what is it? And it was just, where is the checkup located? The checkup. The checkup is online. Okay, so when you open it up and uh, it uh, says displays, and you'll open up and find the displays for the lesson and the checkup and the review of prefix and suffixes. So it is on the online materials. Okay, so we know this program works, that you'll get rewards and they'll get rewards. Uh, and we really appreciate you being here. So we're gonna end there, except I want you to stay after everybody. So Sarah, can you end the recording?